Okay, but what's up, everybody? It's Leon and VT with uh, you know, Texans fan battle after hours, but today is Texans fan battle happy hour. Uh, we both are drinking our beer. It's Friday. Had a tough week, you know. I start uh, a new job on Monday, so you know. Congratulations to Leo, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I got to do a lot of work getting ready for that this weekend, and um, you know, but big week, big weekend ahead of us. We got, you know, a pretty good, you know, opponent opponent tomorrow. You know, although it be preseason, you know, but you know, it's a, you know, the Miami Dolphins, you know, solid team. Um, you know, after a good week of joint practices, you know, uh, and we have a little bit of breaking news for y'all. So it's going to be a jam-packed, you know, action-packed show. So, man, let's get straight into this, man. So we just signed a running back, which I think neither one of us, I definitely didn't see it coming. But, I mean, it's it's a guy, his name is Larry Roundtree. I don't know too much about him, but I think he, I, I'm sure he was on the Chargers previously. Um I know we were just talking about this before we were recording, man. Um, I didn't really see us signing a running back, especially after we cut Valaday. And um, we don't know the specifics on why he was cut. He did just sign with the Steelers, I believe. But, man, yep. I mean, I don't – it's kind of interesting that we cut him and then got another guy. So, let's see what's up, man. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think that he didn't have a great preseason showing, but I don't know if that was the reason. Um, I say that Boone did actually looked really good. Um, you know, if, if I remember correctly, X to the V, who, who I like to call him, um, only had two yards per carry, but he only had like four carries. It's not like, you know, he just had an overall bad game. They didn't give him a lot of carries to choose from. So I would expect that it's probably not just performance. He looked good in camp too. He was catching out of the backfield. So I got to assume it's something else. However, um, it's strange that we let him go and we get a, basically another nobody. Um, I don't think this guy makes a squad and even if he does I don't think he sees anything more than five carries a whole season we've got three really good running backs we obviously have Pierce who's going to be our RB1 we've got Singletary who's going to be the RB2 and we got Boone who we got a good look at in preseason so this other running back honestly it's a non-factor mm -hmm. yeah the only thing I could think of is like like I said previously um before we even start recording was you know maybe he can you know take some load off of these guys in the preseason, because I don't think Pierce is even really playing at all. I don't think Pierce played in the first game, did he? No. Oh, yeah. So, you know, that's one guy. I mean, uh, you know, Devin Singletary, you know, you don't want – I mean, you want to keep these guys as fresh as they can be because, you know, once the season starts, man, I mean, you know, there's going to be games where you don't know necessarily know how many, game, how many carries Pierce is going to get game to game to game. So, you know, I think having guys, you know, having enough depth in the preseason – and, you know, through practices, like, is very important. And I think, honestly, like, that's pretty much all I can say about this. Like, this – I don't think he – obviously, I, I don't think this guy is, like, Walter Payton or, like, Aaron Foster. And <laughs> I'm willing to bet that. And if he ends up becoming, I'll be the first – becoming that, I'll be the first one to say I was wrong, man. So, I guess with lack – with, uh, you know, we can just move right on into the big topic of the day, which is C.J. Stroud, you know. um, the the I mean, I don't even know how I want to frame it because I want to be positive and all that shit. But I think we're just going to talk about, I think, how I framed it was um, struggle, like things that he could possibly struggle with or what it would take for him and the Texans or to make him successful, judging by what we've seen at uh, Ohio State. You know, um, you know, obviously, life at Ohio State is probably like, I mean, obviously, like way, way easier and sweeter than it will ever be in the NFL. And, um, you know, I think the main thing that I feel like that the, before we even draft them, the main thing that kind of, you know, I had not necessarily, I don't even want to say issues with, but things that I thought was pressing was particularly him being out of the top four or five quarterbacks, you know, in that draft. Like he was great at the worst and just, you know, I think he had one of the worst completion percentages of the five, you know, against pressure. And I, you know, that's alarming to me because even though, like, you know, you could you could point to specific instances in film where he overcame pressure when he's able to roll out and make plays, you know, on the run and stuff. The the things that kind of worry me is like what happens when, you know, 
the 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 pocket is collapsing. The edges are very disciplined and they're shrinking the pocket. Like, and he has to step up and make, you know, really, really big time throws and, and stepping up into like, you know, what could be like a murky, muddy situation. I feel like that's what makes a lot of the quarterbacks that we talk about great. Like to me, that's what makes, you know, Burrow so great and like Allen and those guys that, you know, are really fearless in the pocket and, um, you know, also have the arm strength to, um, you know, get the ball where it needs to be without a lot of space, you know. And I think that obviously, like, Burrow doesn't have a big arm, but he has enough arm strength to do that. And I think C.J. Stroud does as well. It's just more so like the mentality and like, you know, what we've seen, I haven't really seen too much because it's it's been fair. Like his line, let's face it, I mean, his line, I think there was basically by the time he graduated, there was at least five linemen that went pro, you know what I mean? I'm not going to – we don't have to list them all. You know, yeah, tight end, you know, um, five receivers that are going to be first-round picks, you know. Um, I think it's five, right? Four or five? Definitely five. Um, you know, and, um, you know, I think Julian Fleming, who's going to get drafted as well. So he had a stacked team going against, um, you know – not to put down a conference at all, because I know a lot of people get real butthurt when you do that, but I'm going to do it anyway. I mean, the Big Ten, they have some phenomenal athletes all throughout. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a D1 school, but, you know, to me, at least on offense specifically, Ohio State is built better than uh, most SEC schools even. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you put them against, you know, uh, Iowa, you know, Pretty much every fucking team, and even Michigan, I think they're way more talented than Michigan. But um, you know, um, you know, so I think it's kind of hard. Basically, my point of view is that I think that 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 problem in his game hasn't really been talked about, or or um, it almost feels like to a lot of people, I, I think they feel like I'm nitpicking when I say that because they haven't, you haven't seen a real game where like. The, his front got dominated, you know, and his receivers got locked up and he had to play mate consistently. And so it's kind of like, uh, you know, it feels like you're nitpicking, but when you look at the numbers, you know, it makes you just wonder how much different we would view Stroud if he was in a program in a place where he did not have all the help with those numbers have gotten better, would they have stayed the same and made his overall numbers worse? And I mean that's pretty much where I'm at, man. So I guess I set it up as good as I can for you to go. Yeah. Yeah. So let me also try to kind of lay it out here. I mean, I think you laid it out pretty well, but I just want to state a few things. So um, Scott definitely had, I think, the best situation in, in the FBS. Um, he was rated as having the best receivers in the country. Um, you're right about the linemen. Um, one of the things that coming out of college, what the thing that I thought would be the most challenging was the fact that when he was under pressure, his completion rate dropped from 70, 70% to about 40%. And that's one of the reasons why anyone that follows me on Twitter or listens to the Texas Band Battle podcast knows that I've been talking about the O-line. Now, the O-line, we've actually spent by next year because another contracts aren't in place, but um, or, or, or doesn't hit until next year, we're going to hit about 78 million or something like that, right around there. That's going to be more than the league, um, uh, meaning that the Lions are a number two, uh, number two spot with 60 some odd million dollars. So we're, we're spending more than $10 million to the second place team. So we're spending a lot of money on this line and we've got holes. One of the issues is depth. Now, here's the thing. Um, Stroud definitely had a great line, but we got Laramie Tunsil, a top three left tackle. We've got Titus Howard, who right now is injured, but, you know, you could say that he's above average. You could call him a top 10 or top 15. Um, some people are going to call him a top 10, though, because um, because his pass pro. Obviously, his run blocking isn't as good. Then you also got Shaq Mason. Shaq Mason is, is a great right guard. So you got three solid, solid players. The issue the, the, is Kenyon Green and Juice Scruggs. So we, when we talk about the things, the, the challenges, the challenges that, that Stroud is facing, it's going to be right in the interior. And the sad part is that's exactly what happened last season with Davis Mills. 
Davis Mills struggles because of the interior. It was Scott Quasim Marriott Center and it was um, Kenyon Green. Now, um, the white guard, um, what was his name? AJ, I, I can't believe I can't remember off the top of my head. AJ Can. He, now, he was pretty much well right below average. He wasn't horrible, but we got a huge upgrade at right guard. The, oh. the thing is, we're staying the same with Kenyon Green. We're hoping that he t um, uh, becomes better. And then we have a rookie at center. Right. So you, so you got Kenyon Green and a rookie. So, you know, I said this in my my last article about the O-line. It was that this season doesn't just depend on the receivers. A lot of people are talking about the receivers. Do we did we do enough to get the right receivers? The season doesn't even depend on C.J. Stroud. Yes, he's a quarterback. The offense particularly depends on two players, and that's Kenyon Green and Juice Scruggs. And unfortunately, in college, Stroud didn't do the best when he became, when he was under pressure. And that's a discussion that we've been having the last few days over Twitter, Twitter spaces, and, and, and our chat groups. And that's what this um, podcast is really all about. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, basically, to, to uh, look at some of the numbers, um, I, I got PFF up. You mm -hmm. know, I'm going to show it. Uh, people, people bring up the Georgia game. He was great in the Georgia game. I'm not going to discredit that. Uh, I do think that um, still, like, a lot of those situations that I saw, uh, and I people will, can feel however they want to feel about this statement as, as well. Jalen Carter whoops the fuck out of the guard. Um, he's like, CJ basically had the best tackle duo in college football last year. As, as Jack Carter whoops the fuck out of whoever's in front of him, there's a decent amount of space that he has to make a move with a 300-pound man, you know what I'm saying, running straight at him, like, obviously it's impressive that he faked him out, but he had a lot of space, still in the pocket, you know, provided the tackles didn't give up much ground. And he delivered, he delivered, you know, plays, right? He made plays. Um, also, I mean, that was pretty much, I mean, he showed good pocket movement in general. Again, another thing also is that he had a month, probably a little over a month to prepare for that game. You know what I mean? Um, so there's that. He did play well. And another thing about that game to me is that, like I say, you can't take anything away from him from what he did. But I mean, when when the tight end went out, I think Stover's his name, when uh when um Marvin Harrison went out, right? There was a noticeable change in the passing game. That's when they did blow the lead. That's when they did all this stuff. So the idea that like, you know. It just kind of goes back to what I was saying, like, is that if you take away a lot of the talent on that team, would he still have been able to produce the same? I think after Marvin went out, bro, I think there was like only one or two throws that was like, you know, 15 yards or more. You know, what I mean, a lot of it was checking down and him running for his life. They weren't able to to, um, you know, con uh, to really sustain a drive at the end of that. And then at the end of the day, he, he missed the field goal. But but the, the yeah the guy missed the field goal after he had a big run to 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 get him to get them in field goal range. Um, my opinion on that is just kind of what I've said is that like I think he's he's kind of benefited from an elite situation and he's proven that if he has a talent he can play on a on a level to like have the team function like pretty much as as well as it can like I don't think necessarily really think he was the engine of that situation you know um but but I mean he did he did show that I, I like people say that he wasn't he couldn't move if you like if you know anything about Stroud I think coming into Ohio State he was a dual threat quarterback he played two sports his whole life he was a basketball player he's not a he's not like a just some clumsy quarterback that can literally only throw the ball like you know um he's a decent athlete it's just kind of the willingness to run, the willingness to get hit. And I think, honestly, for me, when people compare him to Joe Burrow, it to me, at least right now, it's kind of like, kind of unwarranted to me. I understand that in terms of throwing the ball, I honestly might feel like he might be able to throw the ball better than Joe Burrow. But when it comes to like the 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 competitiveness, the um the heart and will. You know, and just like the warrior mindset to me, Joe Burrow is kind of on a different plane. And that's not a put down, right? Like, to me, like, Joe Burrow, like comparing that part of the game to, to you know, to Joe, anyone comparing that part of themselves to Joe Burrow, 
is like they would a lot of people would fall short, right? So that's not a put down. But man, I mean, so but yeah, so generally like that was pretty much the thing. Like people bring up that game, but it still doesn't erase the fact that that those numbers are what they are, right? Like why why was he so bad against pressure versus like Iowa? You know, what and if you go back and really watch that game and be very, very um, you know, unbiased and you know, just look at it, look at how the coaches or like how Ryan Day started calling that game differently as he saw that Stroud was kind of like not playing well. He ended the game in with in spectacular fashion. You look at the stats and they're they're like he doesn't have one bad statistical game. Let's just say it pretty much. I mean, the Northwestern game was you can't really count that because the wind or whatever the fuck, you know, that's fair, right? I get out, but he doesn't have a bad game. But there are instances where you're like, damn, bro, like, like I just don't know, you know? So I don't know, bro. Like I, it's it's really interesting to me. So let me say, um, I, I at first did not want to draft Stroud, right? Like, if again, anyone that knows me knows that I was a Caleb Williams guy. In fact, I still am. Um, I think Caleb Williams, um, when he does get drafted, is going to be an incredible quarterback. What changed my mind was that, number one, we needed a quarterback. Why? Because once we got D'Amico Ryans, we knew that we were not going to be able to tank again. That, that was number one. Number two, we know that the front office was not ready to tank again. Um, you know, after winning just 11 games in three years, they didn't want to have another season where you had to tank to get your quarterback. They wanted to win games. So the, the decision was you had to get a quarterback. Now, you had four choices, really. And we know from reports that Casario really wanted Bryce Young. Now, I was never a Bryce Young guy, not because of his gameplay and not because of his mind, but because of his physique, his body. He is too small, and I feel, and this could be crazy, a cold take, a freezing cold take, that four or five years ago, people could say, V, look how idiotic you were. But I feel that Bryce Young is not going to be, be able to withstand getting hit in the mouth 30, 40 times a year and be able to sustain the same uh, uh, body and be able to make the throws that he needs to make in the NFL uh, for four or five years down the road. I think that's going to be a problem. We know, however, for a fact that Casario wanted Bryce Young. He, he tried to trade up with him with the Bears, and then he tried to trade up again with the Panthers. So he tried twice to get Bryce Young. We also know that C.J. Stroud was the only other quarterback um, that considered they did not consider AR and they did not consider Levis. So it was either Bryce Young or CJ Stroud. So so we're, what I'm trying to do is go through the process of elimination of how we arrived on on drafting CJ Stroud, and then I'll get to my um, my brain right. So so when did I decide that CJ Stroud was the answer for us? I didn't like Bryce Young, um, and my number one choice would have been AR, but I knew that we didn't like him. We didn't even invite him for a physical appearance to come to NRG. So I knew that wasn't the case. I knew that there was no chance that we were getting either AR or Levis. And so the options really were at that time, Bryce Young trading up to get Bryce Young, which who I did not want, or CJ Stroud. Why CJ Stroud? Well, number one, the Georgia game, um, which is talked about quite a bit. And, and as Leo just brought up, he showcased that he can actually make plays when he's under pressure. There is no doubt that at Ohio State, he had the best uh, line combination of line and receivers in the country. But that game showed that you when you're going against Georgia, who were essentially now the Eagles fucking defense at this point. So, so you were going up against NFL talent uh, quite considerably, and he still was able to make plays. And if the kicker actually made that kick, I think we'd be having a different discussion right now. We would be having, and when I say we, I'm not just talking about me and Leo, I'm talking about the country, Texans fans, and, and the rest of the country. The, and, and Because we are talking about that he, that he couldn't get it done, right? That's a narrative. He couldn't get it done because the kicker failed. If that kicker, if that kicker made it, it would have said, oh, he, look at what he did. His, his, his receivers went down. He lost two of his receivers. His line wasn't able to protect him, and he won the game. So I think we got to keep that in mind. Now, another thing that I want to say, one thing that I find really, really positive is that Stroud has showed something he didn't really do all that much in college, which is use his legs. He's done that in the preseason game, and he's been doing that in camp. 
So when receivers have been locked up, when plays break down with the line, because we have a lot of backups right now, um, are running that line, he's able to use his legs. Now, of course, they're not 20 yard runs to four or five, but but he's getting first downs with them. So to answer your question, Leo, or, or at least one of them, of uh, you know, can he actually uh, uh, produce when he's under pressure? I'm going to say not right away, but I think that in the interim, he's going to be able to use his legs to get some positive yardage. And he, and we also know that Dalton Schultz wasn't also out there for a very long period of time either. So 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 he was hurt also in camp. And when he was he when he's hurt in camp, we really don't have a, a, a second tight end because uh, Tegan Quintiano just came back. So we didn't even have a dump off option for him. We we our tight ends are actually another area where we don't have depth. We don't have depth on the line and we don't have depth on the on tight ends. So in camp, when we were saying that he wasn't able to move the ball, Dalton wasn't there, the, the line wasn't good, what is his options? So I think that when it comes to week one, Dalton Schultz, God, let's pray to God that he stays healthy. Let's pray to God that Titus Howard um, comes yeah, back. Um, week one. I mean, every line, every single right. line. Right, right. I want every single line, but what I'm saying like right now, we we, we don't know 100% whether Titus mm-hmm. Howard is coming back. We need them. If they stay healthy, I still think he could succeed. And also, let's also talk about like, I'm not saying this is going to be a week one prediction podcast, but they have four corners out, including their top corner, Mark. Mark Mark is out. So they have four corners out. All four of their top corners are out. That secondary is weak. It's going to be Swiss cheese. If that line could just hold them up from a little bit, we should be able to carve them up. Well, so let me know what you think about that. Well, I mean, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like, like I said, I don't want to say he's going to fail. Not only is he on my team, like, you know what I'm saying? He's a, a guy, like, this is his whole dream, you know, like, to say that I don't want to even apply that I want him to feel at all. It's just the, the the nature of the business and the game that, like, you have to overcome these things. And, and are they overcomable? Oh, my bad. Hold on. All right, y'all. Yeah, so I don't, I don't want him to fail, obviously. But, I mean, I'm just really talking about the things, that, like, the reasons why or, like, I guess, like, the caliber of quarterback he had, he can be. What is his ceiling? What's his actual floor? Um, I think that he has a pretty much as high, pretty much almost like as high a ceiling as anyone, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, it kind of comes down to just like how efficient he can become. I don't think he has like the ability to make a lot of the crazy rollout throws that you see from like a Mahomes or like a uh, who else? Like a like what we think like the the peak AR fifteen. Okay, Caleb. Look- a Caleb Williams. Yeah, Caleb Williams. Um, I mean, I guess like a Herbert, you know. But I think from in the pocket and from like you know rolling out and you know doing, you know like, you know he could he could hit like I think one of the big plays in that Georgia game, it was like a thirty yard pass. He rolled out and hit Marvin like you know on like a kind of like a reroute type thing where like you know he pointed him open and stuff in the corner. Yeah. So like he has adequate arm strength to do that. I don't know that he has like he's not like this crazy super freak athlete though. Um but yeah man, I mean, I think that like part of me wants to say that I think there are like a wide range of outcomes that can you know happen for happen to him. I, I like I think his floor um might be a little bit lower than well lower marginally lower than what people make him out to be, you know. Now obviously that doesn't mean that like that floor, just like how people say AR ceiling isn't attainable, that doesn't necessarily mean that you will ever see, like, C.J. Stroud be complete ass. But, I mean, like, there have been quarterbacks that have struggled with that stuff, that have struggled with the same type of things that he struggled with and not have been have, – haven't been able to adjust themselves in the NFL, you know. So, but, yeah, like, going off what you said, like, um, how can we – put him in this, I guess the next part of the question that we uh, started this with is like, how can the org put him in a better position to be successful? Just like you said, um, they, I think they've already done a sol- somewhat solid job. I think it's kind of wild. I understand why we did the Shaq Mason deal. And I, I just want, and I know understand linemen play a long time and all this stuff, but he's locked down for like t- till 2026. I hope that he can last until 2026. Um, we got Titus Howard. Um, I understand why they paid him. I think that, you know, I've s- 
said a lot of things I, you know, how I think about Titus. Um, but he's good at what he's good at. He's good at pass pro. He struggles. He's good against like good speed rushers, you know, and that's really good. Um, you know, Tunsil, obviously one of the best pass blocking tackles in the NFL. You know, like you said, King Green struggled. Hopefully, um, if we could just get average play from the left guard and center, you know, that's a big step forward. But but again, yes. even moving forward, like from there, I think that we have to continuously um, – I mean, we talked about this the other day. Um, just, uh, you know, put the best weapons around them. Give him opportunity – like um, have guys that can win quickly. Um, I think that there's no real um, – there's obviously – I think Garrett Wilson, so the year that Garrett Wilson and Olave and Jackson Smith and Jigba had, I think Jackson Smith and Jigba basically had like 800 yards more than them in the slot. Um, I think part of that, just like how they say, you know, tight end is a, is a quarterback's best friend. A slot receiver is a quarterback's best friend too. Agreed. And I think that having a guy that can win quickly in the slot for C.J. Stroud, um, as we've seen before, um, is is pretty much paramount, you know, um, to make it as simple and, and easy for him as 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 possible. Get open quickly, get the ball. Get open quickly, give him the ball. Right. Um, that's why we've seen Jackson Smith and Jigba do so well. Right. In in all kind of ways and quick like short routes up the seam, like they almost damn near use them similar to like a tight end in some ways. But I, you know, he's a slot, so I guess that makes sense. But you know, um, so. I think that's very paramount. And the reason I feel like that based off of data, like this isn't just shit I'm pulling out of my ass. I feel like also when Jackson Smith and Jigba went went down, they quickly moved Egg Buka into the slot. And then I think Marvin played a decent amount of slot snaps throughout the year as well, like when Egg Buka wasn't in the slot. So I think having a good slot receiver is very, very helpful. Um Another thing, too, is just like we talk about, like, Marvin Harrison, right? Like, a guy that can win downfield, you know, that can get to his spot quickly and that he can trust to push the ball downfield. I think that's what you need. So, you know, so essentially, like, you need a good O-line. You need a uh, – you need – I mean, not a good – you need a – from what I've seen, you need a great – you want a great O-line. You want a great slot receiver. And you want a, a, a very good boundary receiver. And then on top of that, Stroud has to get better, I think, processing. I think that's something that people don't like to talk about, specifically when it's a black quarterback, because it becomes like this whole, well, you're saying he's stupid. No, yeah, I'm not. I, like, they have slow processing quarterbacks that are white, too. They, I mean, this isn't a thing that's, like, unique to black people. You know, they have slow race, slow quarter, slow processing quarterbacks of every fucking skin color, right? So – I think that's one thing that he has to do. He has to get better at that. And I think, uh, and getting the ball out quickly. Um, something that, you know, I know we don't like to talk, people don't like to talk about Davis Mills having elite qualities anywhere, but Davis Mills was pretty elite in that regard of just getting the ball out, being able to see what was going on. Now, the the the, the success rate and the what happened after he got the ball out, you know, can be debated, right? You know? I think that if we was in a better situation, personally, I truly believe that Davis Mills would have been a lot more successful. But that doesn't matter anymore, and we're here now, and we're talking about Stroud, and I think Stroud has to get better in that regard. And I think that if he can become an elite pro, uh, not not even elite, like if he could become a, a a good to great processor in the league, paired with his physical skills. I think that he can be a top 10 quarterback in the NFL, but I mean, that's a lot. That's, that's, that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. And I think that's what makes our quarterback situation so great. I mean, so yeah, so great. And so like interesting is that, is this guy going to be, um, you know what I'm saying? Like a top five quarterback, or is he going to end up being like an adequate starter? Right. So, so let me say a few things, because uh, you said a lot there, and I agree with a bunch of it, and I don't agree with a, a little bit of it. So I think that 
it's not necessarily that Stroud is a slow processor as much as he is so used to having not needing to process as quickly because his receivers were getting open very quickly, right? So um, I forget the exact stat, but it was more than 60% where he was throwing to receiver with two steps of separation, right? I mean, that's not going to happen in the NFL, um, you know, a lot. And so he's used to that situation. So I think what you have to have now, you have to transition when you have, when you have, you know, two of the best receivers in the country and you were always able to get separation. You had time from the line that now you have to, now you have to learn that it's, it's not necessarily that he lacks that. It's like he didn't, he didn't really have to use it. So now he's in a situation where one, you don't have necessarily elite receivers, right? No one's proven yet. And then number two is that you have a line that has been injured and then now you have rookie status under center and Kenyon Green who's still learning. So you have both things. If you had a strong line and then, but your, but then your receivers weren't elite, that's one thing. But now you have both hitting you at the same time under a rookie OC, under a rookie head coach. So you have, it's not just two things, it's four things, right? That he's got, to, so the thing is, all I'm trying to say here is you do need patience. And I, and I don't think it's worth anyone. I'm not saying you did this because you're not, but the people that are writing him off saying that he should sit for a year and then you should start either Mills or Case Keenum because he's not ready. It's ridiculous. The way that this dude is going to get better is putting him in those situations and then having him learn and say, okay, this works, this doesn't. Let me talk about that interception real quick that we saw in the preseason game. Um, so here's what I think happened. What I think happened is you had that sack and now he was at third and 21 and he had made almost a predetermined, he predetermined this. He was like, it's a third and 21. I can't check down. Why well, I can't check down because what the fuck? I'm not expecting uh, anyone to go and get and, and get a five yard, uh, just a you know, five yard throw and, and, and get me a first down. I got to do something to get the first down. That's what, what was in his head, right? So he saw, I believe it was Tank, right and then and he, and he stared him down and then and he he pumped fake him and then he threw but he threw to him right away so mills the cb not our quarterback saw what he was doing and grabbed it now he's a veteran too so you had a veteran db out there who, who actually saw what strad was doing easily and, and caught it and the thing is you also have to realize that he had just gotten sacked, right? So he was also, he made that throw, he predetermined that throw. He did not go through his reads. Now, something you also got to consider, and this is what DJ Bienemy said um, on our show on Wednesday, which I didn't pick up until he, until he said it, is that if you look at the plays that, are be, that were being called, they're all mirror plays. And I didn't really see that until I thought about it. I look at the highlights. It's only 15 minutes. You can watch it again real quick on, on YouTube. So if you look at the highlights, what you'll see is he's right. You'll see a receiver on the left doing the same thing on the right. And it's like that all the fucking time. And so right now, Slowick is only showing vanilla stuff. Now, that's not against Slowick. That's, that's what I believe. Is, this is just a vanilla play call shit that you're going to get. He's not scheming anyone open. He's just putting out shit up there so we can actually have, you know, just a function. Just to see basics of what someone can do. So what i'm trying to say here is that stroud made definitely made a mistake right like like but you have to understand the the reason the context for that mistake the context is that line was not giving him anything he had 11 snaps and only four pass attempts austin deculus was a revolving door um you know fate was wasn't playing well no one that line was just garbage once you have tunsil out there and titus howard out there and you have you have your two solid bookends that becomes a different line completely also, when you, when you have Shaq Mason out there. So that line is nothing like what we will see once all three of them are actually playing. Number two is that, trust me, even Stroud said himself, he said, even on third and 21, you're not going to get the first down. He learned it. He, he not, oh, I can't do that. It's in his brain. I'll take the check down. Even though it's not going to be a first down, I'll take the check down. We'll punt. We'll fight to live another day. Way better than getting an interception and a potential pick six, right? So... I think I think what he need, and this is why you start him. This is why you start rookies that aren't even ready because they're gonna put this in the bank. Because as I told you, Leo, I think that next year that's when we when we can get to the playoffs. And I think this year is learning what you can and cannot do in the NFL. And we're gonna have some bad games where CJ Strauss is learning an awful lot. But if you don't have them out there and you don't have them um, having live reps, you're not able to cash it up in the bank. 
put it in the bank and learn from that. And you won't make that same mistake next time. It, because here's the difference between Mills and CJ Stroud, right? There's a couple of different differences. Mills continually makes the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. And, and what we want to see with CJ Stroud is, is he doing that? Is he not learning from his mistakes? We already see that CJ Stroud is throwing the ball quicker. He's releasing the ball quicker. He's not holding on to it as long. He's still holding on too long, but he is getting the ball out quicker. What, what else has, we, has he done? As I mentioned earlier, he's starting to use his legs. He's not just going through double coverage. He's using his legs and realizing that he can use his athleticism to get him those yards. Those are just some simple things that he's learned and he will continue learning. And I have faith that but with CJ Stroud and then Bobby Slowick also is going to be able to scheme certain dudes up. Now you talked about the slot. Now we have, we have Xavier Hutchinson playing the slot. We have Tank Dell playing the slot. We have Mechie in the slot. We have, we have three rookies that are going to be playing in the slot. Now, of course, they're going to be playing elsewhere at, uh, at the same time. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not at the same time, but you know what I mean? Like they will be playing elsewhere as well. But the point is that they have three options for that slot. So I think that you will, ha- you will see that a lot where you're going to have receivers all over and you have three strong dudes playing the slot to make sure that Stroud can find someone open. And we're not going to have just these mirror plays. You, he will actually scheme receivers open. If we could talk about... The first game, right, Baltimore, one of the things I think we will have an advantage on if our line is straight is because that secondary is so injured that we can take advantage of that. And I do think that, yes, we will run the ball. We will use play action. But I think that we potentially could see C.J. Stroud, yeah, even if he throws a pick or two, but have some a, 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 a decent amount in, in passing. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes out there, has a 250-yard game his, his first day out. Yeah, so. I can see that, too. It's going to be a tough game because of Roquan Smith, though. I mean, attacking somewhat like in the middle of the field, you know what I mean, with a guy like that and Patrick Queen next to him. And I think the problem, the, another interesting thing is, is like, I mean, I, I they lost Calais Campbell. So, like, you wonder, man, like, you know, how big of a loss is that? I think that's a, a very big loss for them. But they do um, have a rookie that they drafted last – or a second-year player that they drafted last year. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, and that's a beer. <laughs> yeah. um, in times of, like, uh, Travis Jones, right? So, Travis Jones is another big six foot four, six five, really athletic, you know, 320 pound, you know, interior defensive lineman that, you know, we hit, we're going to have to, I mean, it's, I, I guess like we just got to, well, nobody knows how good or bad he is right now. So like if he ends up being the same thing as Calais Campbell, it could be a tough game. I mean, but at the same time, like, you know, we, you never know. I think that that game is definitely attainable through the ways that you said. And, um, you know, I think the defense should be improved. And we're healthy right now. So, I mean, let's hope and pray that we are, that we stay healthy through, you know, the whole season. But, yeah, man, I mean, you said a lot there. Um, it's just a lot of, of ways that it can go. And the thing is, is that nobody can say um, exactly what it's going to be. I mean, I hope that he ends up becoming someone that's worthy of a, of a second contract, for sure, that we feel comfortable with you know, and that we can win the Super Bowl with. But, you know, yeah, man, so we do have slots. You know what I'm saying? We have Nico Collins, you know, outside. And you hope that he can take a major jump this year to where, like, we could just – but, I mean, at the end of the day, you just need weapons. Uh, Weapons, you know, you want to have a good run game. You want to put as many – you almost want to put Stroud in a situation – to where, like, I mean, you know, where all he has to do is just literally just focus on his execution and not necessarily and, – and have him making as, you know, you don't want – I mean, this is just for any quarterback, right? You don't want them having to make, you know, uh, you know, sugar in the, or shit in the sugar, you know, I mean, for, like, long periods at a time, you know? Because I think, man, what's wild is, like, people see Mahomes – and, um, you know, we saw Watson and, um, you know, elite quarterbacks like that. And especially the wild plays. Like, people look at the wild plays, but the the plays that, like, bro, 
Mahomes gets, I mean, so many yards just schemed up easily to him by Reed. I mean, that it's crazy. Like what makes Mahomes special is the is the uh to me is like it's not necessarily the wild plays, it's the 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 ability for him to be like this field stretching you know what I'm saying, dynamic quarterback. But at the same time, he's able to function inside of the offense. Like, he's able to do all the little shit right. And to me right now, and I mean, that's what I wonder about Stroud also, is like, if Stroud can do that, you know what I'm saying, and you put all this talent around him, then, like, we'll, we'll be fine. And I think right now, right now, it's week one of – we only saw one game. 11 fucking snaps. Yeah, 11 snaps. But going into the next game, right, like, we're going to have to see him do more of that stuff well because all the stuff that, I mean, you were on the podcast and we talked about this throughout the summer um, before the draft and stuff. Like, his mechanics, his footwork, all that stuff, like, it did not look like the same quarterback to me that I saw at, at – uh, for the majority of his time at Ohio State, right? Like, he, he, he was... But don't you think that's somewhat expected? His first game in the NFL, the, the line was basically garbage, um, and, and he's going up against veteran DBs um, and linemen here. Now, of course, some of them were second stringers, I get that, but you had some du- some real dudes out there. I'm not necessarily just excusing his performance completely because... I do think, listen, on that interception, that line actually held up on that play. Yeah. You know, he just made the wrong call. But even, like, right. even on the first play, like, I mean, he's back there, like, he's, like, moving his feet. And, like, Nico Collins is open on his break the whole fucking time. And he's just, like, you know, uh, he just didn't look settled. And I think all I'm saying, I, that's not me writing him off, right? That's just me saying what we all saw. And the, the, pro, the, the, the fact is, is that, if he looks like that tomorrow, you know what I'm saying? Which I don't think he – I hope he doesn't. But if he looks like that again tomorrow for the majority of his snaps, then we're going to – it's going to be – you know what I'm saying? Like those those Mills questions are going to be louder and louder and louder. Or, or not Mills questions. Those who's going to start week one questions are going to be loud. But, and that's something I want to talk about too because I know that it's, it's a big thing amongst Texans fans right now. And we can separate this into a whole nother video. Like the thing that like a lot of Texans fans are talking about right now is whether he should start week one if if he you know if he's not ready. Like I've seen people that that are very very well versed in the league say both things. Right, say what you said that he needs to play no matter what. Excuse me, and and I've also seen I literally saw heard an NFL player that play with the Oilers say that he shouldn't start. Yeah, I saw the whole, that the whole year. He said the whole year. Yeah, but listen, I mean I got I gotta interrupt you and say this one thing though. We have heard players, I'm not even gonna say who because I love him. He's a great friend of the show. But he but some players say some whack ass stuff. All right. Um we had a player tell us that we would now that Hopkins is on the Titans, he thinks that we will trade for Hopkins in the middle of the year. Like, like some players will say some whack ass stuff. You can't, I, I don't think you can just say he's an NFL player and that's what we should go by. Sean Salisbury is saying well, that he should set a whole fucking year. I mean, like, yeah. we, well, we can't. I, I wasn't saying that, like, I was just saying that he's definitely knowledgeable the game for some reason, you know, like, and I know, I know that I, I agree, like, you know, for sure. Like, you can't say, uh, yeah, yeah. Some people, uh, how do I say this, like, some players yeah, some are... players don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They're great yeah. on the field, but then you talk to them and they're like, damn, bro, that's kind of wild as fuck. <laughs> right. Like, um, you know, I mean, at least in terms of team building and all that shit, because the odds of us trading for Hopkins after we didn't just try to sign them and then, you know, that's kind of wild. But but anyway, I, I was just more so just saying that, like, th- there's opposite ends of the spectrum. I kind of find myself falling – in the middle of it, like, I definitely think that he needs to play this year. He needs to play yeah. pretty fast, right? I think, you know, I think he needs to play within probably the first four weeks for sure. But I think that 
if he's not ready to start week one because of him not being able to protect, knowing how to protect himself properly, him not being ready just in general, I don't think that there's any you, – there's no benefit to put him out there against a team that is a playoff team, right? A team that, like, you know, putting them, uh, uh, like, out there against one of the most, like, you know, vicious defenses in the league right now. And, you know, I, I just – I wonder if that's – like, I wouldn't I wouldn't be mad if Mills started week one with, knowing that they're continuously prepping Stroud to, to start. But at the same time, he's taking all the reps. And at this point, it's like, shit, how do you know that Mills would do better after not taking reps with the ones for, like, going on? By that time, it would almost be a month. Nine practices. Right. So, I mean, we've kind of back, backed ourselves into a corner to where, like, he, he has like, to start. Yeah, he has to start. So, Right. And, and like, listen, I said this a couple weeks ago, and I'll say it again. I bet my house that he's going to start week one. Why? There's, there's football reasons and non-football reasons. Number one, the front office won't allow Davis Mills to be out there. They know that, like, I mean, this is not a football decision but or, or conversation necessarily, but just based on what people want. People are excited because of D'Amico, a new quarterback, a new pass rusher, a new head coach, a new OC. They don't want the same old shit that we had last year. And Davis Mills is not the face of this franchise. It's C.J. Stroud. Um, And and it's D'Amico and C.J. Stroud. And there's no way that the front office is going to allow Davis Mills to be out there for the season opener. And definitely not going to continue to do that for the home opener against the Colts. Like, it's just not going to happen. Number two is that, as you said, Stroud has been taking the reps with the one. It hasn't been Davis Mills. Um, we had DJ Biennemi on the show, and we and um, we had that question asked, right? Uh, a commenter said, is, is there a real QB battle? And he said, although there has he that Stroud hasn't been named the starter, there is no QB battle, essentially. It is Stroud. Davis Mills is the backup. That's the way it, that's the way it is. Case Keenum is already hurt. He played one preseason game, and he's hurt. So he's obviously not a starter. Some people who obviously like Case Keenum, for many different reasons from the past, want him to start. That's not going to happen. The the starter here is Stroud. I just think people have to understand that you have to live with the growing pains. Let's go back in history and look at how did Josh Allen look in um, in 2018 when people were saying that he should lose his starting job, right? Um, How did Jalen Hurts look where people just last year no, not this past season, the, before he went to Super Bowl, the season before that, people said he's not a starter and, and that the Eagles made a mistake drafting him. The dude went to the Super, uh, dude won the Super Bowl that following year after everyone was knocking him. It's going to take time for Stroud to develop. People are saying that, hey, we have so much talent, we should go to the playoffs this year. Hey, you know what? I'm not saying it's, it's impossible. I don't think it's going to happen. But I don't think it's uh, I don't think that's reality. I think that we still have a lot of learning to do. I think we have to be patient as a franchise. We have to be patient and realize that it takes time for quarterbacks to learn. It typically takes most quarterbacks three years until we actually know who they are and how they perform. And so if people are making these decisions after one fucking preseason game, four fucking pass attempts. Like some of it drives me insane on how someone can say that the that mill should start after four pass attempts in a preseason game with backup linemen we have third stringers out there for god's sakes not even second stringer second string linemen and think that cj strout should not start based on four pass attempts it, it, it blows my mind blows my mind oh like yeah i mean but they i mean he he looked pretty bad man i mean he looked bad you know four pass attempts how can you look great I mean, bro, like, to be honest, if he doesn't throw that egregious turnover, like, if he doesn't throw that egregious pick on his side of the field, like, like, bro, there was no reason to force that ball. Like, that, I mean, that it was a terrible pick, bro. There's no way around. It was a very, very bad pick. And then the play before that, bro, like I said in the chat and everybody. Was the, the play like, before that, he was sacked. The play before that, bro, like he like um so Quesenberry gets beat across his face immediately almost. 
before he's even at the back of his drop. Not Quesenberry. You... My bad. My bad. I was just so used to fucking saying Quesenberry gets dropped. <laughs> come up. Come it's closer. Like, huh? Go, yeah, there you go. Closer, because you were. Oh, yes. my... Like yeah, it was it like him hit like Deculus got beat immediately before he's in the back of it, before he's like he basically hits his back foot. And then once he, he hits his back foot, the guy is within reach of him, right? Like, like he, you know, like I said, he should have just taken the sack. He tried to fight it. He damn near tried to stiff arm him. He could have fumbled the ball, and he lost five more yards and put his body at risk, right? So, like, yeah, he got sacked, and it wasn't completely his fault. But he he also made a – he took a bad play and made it worse, right? Worse. And then the next play – like he does that, and it's like, bro, that pick to me, that pick showed a complete unawareness for the situation. I understand everything that you said. It's third and twenty, and this and that, and third. And the kid is probably nervous as fuck. He right. is nervous as fuck. He's waited his whole life to do this, and now he's doing it. And like, you know, it's just I, I can only imagine what that feels like. You know, uh, to be in that situation on that stage after working your whole life to do this, right? But at the end of the day, he threw the ball on his own, like, on his own, like, 20-yard line and gave them the ball basically in field goal range and scoring position damn near immediately. Like, and we held, we held them to a field goal. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, great by the defense and by the, the um, you know, by our, our you don't know, D'Amico, I will give credit, you know, where it goes, right? Absolutely. But, like, the thing is, is that the kind of team that we're going to have to be, that we're going to have to win games, the shit that people, you know, laughed at fucking Daniel Jones for doing last year and other type quarterbacks like that, right? Like, him not turning the ball over, not making those egregious mistakes. Like, yeah, he wasn't throwing touchdowns and shit. I don't know how the fuck you expected him to throw touchdowns with Saquon Barkley leading the fucking team in targets, right? There was no explosive nature, anything explosive on that team downfield. And to prove that, what was the first fucking thing they did? They went out drafted the fastest goddamn receiver in the draft. And then they got then they went out and got the best deep threat big receiver, receiver slash tight end in the fucking league, basically. And um you know, when he's been healthy, Darren Waller. Waller. So they knew that they had a fucking issue too, right? So what I'm saying is that, like, like if we're going to be this defensive team, which a lot of people don't really admit, that's what the Giants actually were last year. They won the turnover margin. They, they, their defense, their offense, their offense was pretty fucking mid. I mean, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they, they had, they basically were a ball control offense. They were. You know, and and like so, for us to win games, he can't make that mistake because D'Amico's not gonna have to do that. And I'm just saying, and I understand it was four passes, but the thing is, is like we have to see improvement. Like tomorrow, we can't see the same shit. Like I can't see him throwing a dumbass pick on our side of the field tomorrow. I can't see him get taking a sack where it's clearly a sack. Like. This wasn't the Jalen Carter instance where he has five yards between him and, and where he's at in his drop and all this shit, and he has room to work. The, like, there was nowhere for him to go when uh, – I forget the guy's name when, – when he beat Deculus. There was no – like, there was nowhere for him to go, right? So, I just – I personally, if I see those type of plays over and over again tomorrow, I'm going to be wondering, like, should he actually start, bro? Because so, I mean, I've seen, like, I understand what people are reporting, but I've seen, I, I've seen there's instances where the offense does look smoother with Mills, right? Uh, I mean, now it doesn't have the same explosiveness that Stroud had. Like Stroud is, is he's, he's nailing, like he's, he's pushing the ball downfield, right? And it just goes back to all the little shit that I talked about. What makes my homes great, right? Like. If if Anthony Richardson can can run an offense like as as efficiently as fucking Daniel Jones and as efficiently as like you know Kirk Cousins and fucking all the quarterbacks that get laughed at like Derek Carr, then he will end up being Mahomes because he's gonna fucking have all the little bitty shit together and then on top of that the explosiveness that is like 
one percent like a bit, you know, not one percenter type shit, right? So like there's le there's a lot of different intricacies to this. And I mean, that's what makes the whole thing for me just very, very uh, a sensitive, delicate issue. You know what I mean? But I do, like we said, I think he's going to start, you know? So let me just say a few things because you talked about, you know, how um, Davis Mills performed in camp. And what I want to, want to say is that Davis Mills did, actually did okay in seven on sevens, but we don't we run a lot of seven sevens at camp. We actually run way more 11 and 11s. Um, but when they when he did run on 11 and 11s, um, he was one for six last time. So the thing is, is that- Last time is in against the Dolphins? Against the Dolphins, yeah, right. So so the thing is, as, as, as camp has progressed, Stroud has gotten better and, and and as you know, pads came on and 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 defenses were able to do more and more. Mills got worse. The the reason why the um a lot of times where you see that uh, it sounds like Mills gets better, especially when you look at the numbers. Oh, he was four for six, whereas Stroud is say three for six, is because he checks downs a lot, right? Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the but the thing is that if you also notice, he didn't get in, he didn't get to a scoring position it was either left to a field goal um but he wasn't throwing necessarily touchdowns right so so mills will will connect because it's not hard to connect on a three four yarder but he wasn't getting into scoring position and so you got to look at away from the stats and and also look at that context um in context you know when it comes to drills mills is looking good when it's on when it's not when he's not pressured uh so did Stroud. Um, when when we're talking about 11 and 11s, when we're talking two minute, uh, a two minute drill, Mills isn't able to get in the end zone, right? So so it's not that he's looking so much better under Stroud under real game conditions, because real game conditions he looks either the same or worse. He doesn't look the same or better. And so I think that at that point you have a veteran who is not able to break away from Stroud like if he was actually real better like we're talking about always getting into scoring position um not getting not getting a ton of picks he's get like Mills had you know three picks in a uh in a day right like so like we're not talking about a situation where Mills has just looked solid he hasn't what we have seen is that he just checks down a lot and when Dalton Charles is there or or when when he's healthy yeah you're gonna make those throws who's not going to now, real game conditions are different. That's why I think th this, this whole thing of, oh, Mills looks good. Well, yeah, he has looked good when he checks down. The whole point is, can you get into the red zone? Can, can you actually score? That's what I think where, where Stroud is better. Again, one of the biggest things is that he's right now forcing, right? He's still forcing balls where he shouldn't. Pause. Yeah, uh, Stroud, Stroud. 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 Stroud in camp. He's still forcing. So that's where he, that's going to take – Time. And what I what I said was he's going to learn when he can who he can trust in order to win win those balls with like like Nico is a great dude when, because he can win those contested catches. Right. So he's going to learn when he can trust Nico to do that. Xavier Hutchins is, is too, but they're not giving him as many snaps as I want him to. Right. So that's going to take some time. I don't I wouldn't be surprised if Stroud continues to throw a couple picks uh, per game for a while because he's still learning. Right. But, but I think, you know, when it comes down to like week eight, week nine, and he's in a rhythm, you're going to see a completely different Stroud mid-season than we do week one, week four, week five. And, and okay, like, and this is a whole other discussion that I'm going to cut up to, like, well, then when you're saying that stuff, right, like, I get the, and I mean, I guess these are bringing up, you know, summer draft type situations or, or conversations all up again. But I mean, fuck it. Like, let's be real and honest here, and because this is a, this is kind of like a, a turning point in our in our um, franchise, right? We finally hired a coach after three like nebulous years, basically. Um, the the I like that vocab word. Yeah, <laughs> three three years of uh of you know. I mean, just kind of like without a, a a head coach, right? Right. Um, you know. Bill O'Brien's fired one year, uh, Cully and um, D'Amico. And now, whether or not people want to face it, because, you know, you know how fans are. Everybody wants to believe that 
the, everything has changed and we're we're all stable now and no matter what like we are in a, a model organization not really true because at the end of the day we literally just did what every fucking org does hire a fucking coach <laughs> and i know it feels like something that's just so new to us because it's us but in reality we literally just hired a fucking coach that we're going to give the franchise to for the next three, four, five years, hopefully. God willing, right? But at the end of the day, Nick Casario has one of the worst records. And I, I don't, I mean, as a GM, as an executive, he, like, no matter how you feel about him, how, like, his track record, he has one of the worst, he has one of the worst fucking, uh, you know, records as, probably, for sure, the worst record as a GM in the NFL right now. Like, you know, you can add all the context to it you want to, but let's face it, you know, that's it is what it is. So we're 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 in this situation where we do we we make the trade for Anderson, you know, but we know like it's it's a lot of like gray area and that shit also. Um and Nick is on the hot seat. And you brought up something too that I wanted to come back to and I guess we're circling around to it right now. Is that we're not tanking with D'Amico. The thing is, is that like I don't think you have like you don't choose the tank. Like the 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 unfortunate reality of this situation is that like this still like we're talking about growing pains and, and a quarterback that you're saying like might throw two two picks a game, multiple picks a game. For the first, you said five, six weeks? Yeah, I'm saying like until really the lie that he might be throwing picks until he learns what's going on. Do you think on. that this team is good enough to survive multiple turnovers? I think the defense can get the ball back. I think that's. I think the heart and soul of this team is not going to be the offense, man. Oh, uh, I, get, I understand that, you know. Right, so so I think that you know our secondary. I think we have a top five secondary. Let's get that out of the way. I think that when all is said and done, at the end of this year, we will have a top five secondary by passing yards, um, particularly uh, points per game, um, the whole shebang. I, I'm not even saying just interceptions because you can have crazy years where another team gets a ton more interceptions than us. But in terms of passing yards and points per game, we're going to be a top five secondary. I think our front seven is way more improved. It looks really strong, particularly against that Dolphins um, line. And the Dolphins line ain't no, you know, ain't no uh, stupid thing, right? Like they've actually got a good core, right? A real good core. And we were beating them up, slamming them. So I, I really do think our front seven is going to be much better, which means that we're also going to stop the run, not like last year. So I, so I think that the defense is going to help us win those games. And when I say, let's also remember, when I say win those games, I'm talking about seven games here. Seven games gets, essentially gets you out of range of getting a top five pick, right? A top five pick means that you're not getting the quarterback, say Caleb Williams, Drake May. You're also not get, getting Marvin Harrison Jr. So if you're not picking in the top five, which is when I say you're tanking, if you're tanking, you're in that top five. Outside top five, you're not taken, right? So if we're not able to get a top five pick in seven games, you're not getting a top top five. That's what I said. When D'Amico's here, so, we're so not what, taken. What is the ceiling of this team in terms of wins and losses? I mean, the ceiling's nine or ten games, I would say. Um, I think that I'm predicting seven games, six on the low, really. But, like, I, I think that it is not out of the realm of fucking crazy that we get nine nine wins here. The reason I'm asking this is because, like, the thing to me that makes all of this stuff so strange and so weird and the, the interesting part of the season, like, the, the the irony or the parody or, like, whatever you say, like, if we was, like, watching, like, a fucking TV show, the underlying, like, you know, I'm pushing all my – I don't know. Have you watched, like, Snowfall or anything? I haven't seen Snowfall. You know, like, or like, I'm watching you know, Succession right now. I guess breaking Breaking Bad. I have okay. I've seen Breaking Bad. Yeah. So like you know, there's always the underlying thing, even though you know there's like eight fucking seasons. Is like, is he gonna get caught? Is he gonna die? Is he gonna get shot or something right. like yeah. that? Right? Like in any you know drop drama or like uh, action packed uh, movie or a series. 
like the 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 wanting to understand like of uh, you know I guess like the how you say like the push and pull of like harmony and dissonance, right? The 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 thing that I I guess that blows up Texans fans when I talk about all this shit is like listen, I mean the fact is is that like I understand the ceiling. Like nine, ten wins is a that would be an amazing year for us, right? But yeah. The the truth is is that like like we could be right in a situation where we're a three or four win team again, four four or five win team again, and I wouldn't necessarily blame D'Amico or Slowick. I mean, we're like God forbid, we're like one or two injuries away from not being that. You know what I mean? All right, one here is away let from me give you the same mm-hmm. team that we were last year. Let me say the only way that happens, in my opinion is if Tunsil gets hurt and Howard gets hurt. It's all going to take one of them. If, if they're hurt, if they're hurt, our season's over. You're right. But but you but what I'm when I say we we are not tanking, I am not figuring figuring that our bookends go down, right? Because what are the chances of both our bookends go, God, please don't let this happen. But like what are the chances? I don't think, but see, that's what I'm saying. I don't think it's gonna take that much. All it really takes is Ken Green not being what you think. No, 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 because no, this is why it matters. Because if if our bookings go down, heck is already hurt and he might not come back for the rest of the season. So if you have Tunsil hurt, okay, you put Heck there. We don't have Heck. So that means you don't have a first, you don't have a second well, you're saying, third but straight left tackle. What I'm saying is that like I don't think it's gonna take I don't think the only scenario for us to be that bad. Is just hit and or just the tackles. Like, if we lose one of those receivers and another one that comes in and isn't ready to, isn't isn't great. Like, you're you're looking at a bad team. If Shroud, like, if you're talking about, these I disagree teams, on the receivers. I disagree with you. I'm We've got like, enough mid receivers. If one goes down, we got another mid receiver right there. Another mid receiver. That's his. because think about it. it. We don't have any elite receivers. We don't right. have a single. I mean, the difference between this team last year, and I I hate, I hate that I'm saying this shit, but like the thing is, is that, okay, when guys go down, we aren't never going to be in the position where we're putting our fucking tight end or backup quarterback as a wide receiver three, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that that player that that it will be there will will be like very productive, right? So what I'm saying is that like, like we're, we're not that deep. Like when the people laughed at the Saints for making that trade for when they traded their first, but at the end of the day, like their floor was seven games, right? Because at their worst, through all the injuries and all that shit, they were still able to win seven games. And my thing is like, I get, I get it, but what I'm saying is that like, and I, I guess you can't think like this when you're making business moves and anything, right? Right. Like. But the reality is, I mean, as a fan, for me, in my fan sense, is like, well, damn, bro. I mean, there's, like I said, bro, like, there's instances where that, that shit can happen. I do think that we have an elite secondary as far as the starters. But what if Jimmy Ward goes out? What if, I mean, and I don't want this shit to happen at all, at, at all, you know? Uh, what if Jimmy Ward goes out? What if Nelson or Stingley? But then we bring your boy MJ Stewart, right? I mean, like yeah, I like MJ Stewart, but he hasn't played. You know what I mean? And, and they there was something that made them go out and get Jimmy Ward. And what I'm saying is that, like, when we talk about top five secondaries, that's like it's so many like levels to the league. It's like the difference between a fourth and a fifth ranked secondary, or a fifth and a sixth ranked secondary can be a lot of fucking players. Like when I look at the Saints secondary, like. I'm looking at guys like they could go three or four deep at like outside corner. So let me just say this about a secondary, right? Um, And I'm going to do a a shameless plug too. So first of all, we have, I honestly, our secondary, we have the most amount of depth. We have players that you're not here. Like we just did a fourth quarter with Jacoby Francis. He goes by Colby, number 38. He's a guy that you probably know. uh, The only reason you probably know him is on preseason where he grabbed, he actually made a couple good plays. Nice tackle, too, but he actually grabbed, I forgot who it was, uh, the helmet, and then we got a penalty, so they replayed that a lot. So, uh, anyway, check out the fourth quarter. We talked to Kobe. He's a really cool guy. But he could play safety. He could play corner. He could, he could play outside, inside, 
uh, Nickelback. I mean, he really can play everything. Um, you have Shaquille Griffin, who hasn't necessarily showed everything up in camp, but he can, he's also a good depth piece. So it's not like we don't have depth pieces. You got Trevor Thomas. Like, we've got depth pieces in the secondary. Now, obviously, they're not as good as the starters. That's why they are depth pieces. But it's not like we're fucked. The secondary, if, if we lose a piece, we could put someone else in there. Obviously, production won't be the same, and but the drop-off won't be disgusting. The same thing with receivers. If Collins, for a bit, goes down, you could put Xavier Hutchinson in there. Now, he's a rookie, but he has a very similar skill sets, you know, in terms of size. He doesn't necessarily have the same speed, but he has a lot of the other traits that Nico Collins has. So you can replace him. Right. Um, you know, so the real question, in my opinion, when we talk about depth, is the offensive line, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, yeah, I, and I get that. I get that, you know. That's the scary part. That's where we could be a four-win team. So, so going back to your overall question is, you know, you're basically saying, like, we are very close to being a three-four win team. And what I'm saying is that I don't think that's the case because, first of all, the coaching, I believe, is going to be better. And I believe that D'Amico, particularly on the defensive side, he's a defensive genius. He, he has been a top, he has led a team to being a top three, if not top one defense for the past two years, right? So he has a track record of, of play calling and making that defense work. Now, of course, he had incredible talent, but we're not extremely talent deficient the way we were just one season ago. We actually got some real talent, right? Yeah. So let me just switch my point real quick. All right, so you got Domico. So he's already going to be a better defensive coach. Now, I know that he gave Matt Berth the play calling for the preseason game, but, you know, regular season, he's be calling the defensive plays. What you, you got to question, though, is Bobby Slovak. However, Bobby Slovak, the reason why I think that he's a little, a little special here is because one of the things that he did, right, um, um, Mikey D in, in Miami said this, right, when he worked with Slovak, Slovak worked on the defensive side first. So he, you know, when, when, when he was in Washington and stuff like that. So he worked, he worked on the defensive side. He understands analytics. He went, he spent two years at PFF. And then they switched him to the offensive side because Kyle Shanahan said, you're too smart to stay on the defensive side. Come to the offensive side. And he, when he was a passing game corner, he was very involved with D'Amico because D'Amico also, I mean, I don't know if people don't know this or not, but D'Amico, not only did he play on, on the offensive side because he started as a center, but he also learned the offensive side before he became a DC. And he did that particularly because he wanted to do better at his position. When he was a linebacker uh, in Houston, he actually would go and learn about the offense to be a better linebacker. When he, when he was, uh, when he was at, um, in San Francisco, he learned the offense uh, working with culture and, and to be better as a DC. So you have d the relationship between Domico and Slowick where they've learned the other side of the ball to be better at, at who they can be now, right? So I do think that Slowick should be a better uh, coach as well. So that's why I'm saying like, of course, no, there's no guarantees because essentially we have all rookies everywhere from the head coach to the OC to the quarterback to the pass rusher, blah, 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 blah. We all know that on paper, it looks like we should win five games maybe. Right, you're saying three or four. Um, no, I'm saying I'm I'm not I'm saying that like the, what I'm saying is that like I don't necessarily think that there is like a foregone conclusion that we can't necessarily have a top three pick that we're trading away. That's what I'm saying. Like gotcha. it's not like it's a hundred percent foolproof, is what I'm saying, because of the lack of depth, because even in our secondary, like I, I get it, like. I get, I get it, like you know what I'm saying, but I think, and I, and I also know that we do have depth. We have depth at slot corner, and I think, particularly Desmond King can play inside, outside. But all I'm saying is that, like, we're still like it's still it's still kind of worrisome because I'm not really sold on all the depth, and I think that, and I, I understand what you're saying about receivers, like. If you lose Nico Collins, like there's guys that's like similar to him, kind of, you know, behind him. But at the end of the day, it's kind of like the situation with like, okay, like, I don't know. It, it, it's just, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of a lot to take in, you know, but, but I mean, I, I do, obviously, I think 
And I was just talking to someone earlier today, bro. I was like, dog, like, I didn't realize that we literally basically have four new – we basically, re- like, replaced our whole receiving room outside of Nico Collins. Yeah, exactly. You know? But that said, like, we don't know what – we don't know what the fuck these guys are actually going to be. Yeah, we have three fucking rookies. We have no idea how they're going to perform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. So, like, I, I, like, I can say in my mind that – I believe like Mechie will do better than Chris Moore did last year and Tank Dell will do all that shit and, you know, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, like, we also have to see it, you know? So well, let me ask you a question because you have said that, you know, from CJ Stroud's preseason performance, you, you are saying that you can judge some of it, right? So why can't we judge some of Tank Dell's performance? Because, he had 65 yards. He had a touchdown. He uh, he 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 was really good, frankly, for his first outing. Um, if we can judge a little bit of C.J. Strauss' performance with with limited snaps, can't you judge Tank Dell' performance and say that he's going to be a fucking stud? Well, yeah. I mean, I thought that Tank Dell Tank Dell was honestly my favorite. My my favorite. Well, like my favorite, like under the radar draft pick. You know, I think like. But I, even still, it's like, I mean, does that mean that, like, he's going to come in and get, like, 800, 900,000 yards? I mean, I don't I don't think any receiver's going to have that this year. And see, but see, that's the thing. Like, when I think of, like, a, a seven-win team, eight-win team, like, we can't be that. But, I mean, like, the thing is, is, like, like, you know, you have to have – those teams generally still have that, right? Like, or right around that. Like, you know, I'm thinking about Atlanta, uh, the Falcons, not the Falcons, the Saints. I mean, who else was, like, hovering around that? I mean, I don't know how many games the Panthers ended up winning. Um, I mean. How many how many yards did Olave have last year? Do you remember? Yeah, a thousand. Time? Yeah, a thousand. So, yeah. here's, 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 Rasheed, Rasheed, right? Rasheed, Dave, whatever, fuck. Rasheed, uh. Rashad, Rashid, whatever his name, I forget his name. He like led the NFL in like in like yards per catch. So they had an elite, they like he was an elite receiver when it came to like downfield and Olave was just pretty much cooking shit. Even even like the 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 Falcon. I mean not the Falcons, god damn it. The, the, Jets, <laughs> the Jets, right? Yeah, the Jets. The Jets oh, won seven yeah. games. And like like do you they think have rookie of the fucking year? I mean, come on. Huh? Oh, you yeah. know, rookie of the fucking year. Yeah, but I mean, their front seven was also good, like really good. You know, they had an all-pro, like defensive tackle. They had like they could go like Carl Lawson is really underrated to me. Um, you know uh, what else? I mean, the thing is, is that if they would have had solid quarterback play, they would have been a, a playoff team. But my thing is like, is it like obviously it can happen. But the, the the Jets had like a top five defense last year, I think, somewhere in there. Um, is a top five defense realistic for us this year? Not top five, to, uh, top ten, yeah. Um, I still think we have some holes in the front seven, particularly in depth, but also um, I don't know about the other side, right? Because we obviously know we have Will Anderson. Right. Now, we don't know how John, uh, Jonathan Gennard uh, is going to perform. Yes, I finally got my – uh, hands, uh, correct. Uh, uh, oh, it's different from StreamYard. Never mind. Um, so we we don't know how Jonathan Gennard's going to perform. We don't know how Jerry Hughes. What we can't expect him to have the same type of year that he had last year. That dude is old. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen on the other side. We don't know um, if he's going to put uh, Horton out there a decent amount. We just don't know. Then we have to talk about the linebacker situation, right? We think that Perryman is really the starter out there. It looks like that's who he's going to be at, for the mic. But Christian Harris, he played really well last year for the snaps that he was there for because he missed a lot, a lot of the season. But he's looking good. So he could – he, I mean, that's one of – I can't say the X factor, but, I mean, he could be dominant. I mean, he had a pick six against Tua. Um, both Petrie and Christian Harris um, had pick sixes against Tua. Uh, Henry Talatoa, what are they going to do with him? I mean, is he going to play the, the the Sam? Because if he does, I think that's what they do this year. And I think next year they kind of start trying to transition to the mic when his body, um, you know, is there. I, I, I think that linebacker core, I think that is also why we can't be a top five is because too many questions. We, we're going to move dudes around. We're not quite there yet. 
But I, the reason why I'm saying top 10 is because that secondary is going to carry us. We got a much better mic. We got a mic that's the second best coverage linebacker in the NFL on our squad in Perryman compared to Christian Kursky, who can't cover for shit, right? right? So we, we have Christian Harris, who is great at that weak side, and if he can stay healthy for at least 15 games, that's way better than what we had last year. We didn't even have him for basically half the season. We didn't have anyone good, really, for the strong side. I mean, you, and you throw Blake Cashman in there for depth. So we've got better, but the problem is there's still too many questions. I can't say we're top five, but... But so, so like I'm I'm asking that and I say that because like I'm looking at teams right now like the the Jets was seven and ten the the Browns was seven and ten the Commanders was eight and eight and one um hell the Titans was seven and ten last year uh, Carolina the Saints the Falcons was seven and ten and I mean Green Bay was eight and nine you know what I mean. And I think, like, that's the interesting thing about it. And I think if you go back and look at all these teams, like, all the stories of, like, how they ended up being mid, um, they, they're all, like, kind of interesting. Like, like I'm, looking at, I'm looking at the Packers right now. The Packers were literally, like, the definition of mid last year. They was, like, yeah. 15th offense, 17th defense. I'm going by points. Um, the Jets, on the other hand, were top three, top four defense and, like, bottom three offense. So, like, I think, you know, it's possible. But, I mean, it's it's definitely possible. I think that we need – and, I mean, the thing also that you can't really expect is p- people just outperforming and stepping up. Like you're saying, like, you have no idea what – Henry Tall Tall might just fuck around and be so good that, like, I mean, fuck, maybe they maybe he ends up playing over Perriman if he gets hurt or something. You never know. I mean, maybe Dylan Horton is just like way better than he ends up like producing, right? And I right. mean, you know, and then same thing with like, you know, um, you know, the D line as a whole. But but the thing to me is like the D line is like, bro, when I look at it, it's like it's not the same level that the Niners or the Jets is and I say that because the reason I talk about this specifically is that those are the two schemes that basically mirror our as close <laughs> as close as possible and because obviously like you know uh, D'Amico pretty much carried the same type of scheme that Sala did after him I think that um you know I, I think that's why personally I feel like we're a year away from like really being like so say we're like our floor is seven games. And then on top of that, like the ceiling comes to like, well, how good is your quarterback? Or like, how good is your 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 OC? You know what I mean? And shit like that to where like those little fine details can take a team that has a very solid floor into being like, you know, a team that is like a a, a playoff, you know, a playoff team and like a team that can win in the playoffs, right? So it's just like like that's why like I think that everything you're saying is true, right? Like I'm not saying that anyone that thinks that way is out to lunch, but it's also like a lot of and the thing about it, bro, is like also if we have a down another bad year, it doesn't necessarily mean that you lose hope in Stroud or Anderson or D'Amico or Slowick or Matt Burke also. You know what I'm saying? It just kind of means like like you said that, like, we just were a young team. We had a young quarterback. Like, Stroud, bro, like, like, I don't necessarily think it's crazy to think that Stroud might throw a lot of picks early on. But, like, I wonder if we're are, – are we built like the kind of team that can sustain, that can win games if the quarterback turns the ball over? Like, the reason I'm saying we can is because that secondary will be able to get the ball back. Yeah, but but if but like, I mean, just look at what happened the preseason game, right? We we uh, he threw it uh, on our side, and we and we held them to a field goal. Our defense will be able to do that. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So, I mean, well, we've I mean, always if they're, if they're on the field a lot. Like if they're on the field a lot, there's only so much that. You can ask, you know. So it's just. I mean, what did we keep them three? Right? Wasn't wasn't it? I mean, that's all they scored. They scored a field goal, right? 
Or was it two? Was it six? They ended up scoring like they scored a touchdown late. Like, yeah, you're right. You're right. They did. I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, but also sure. remember, I mean, like you know, that was only like, and that's why I'm saying the thing about Stroud is like, would he have turned the game around? Like we don't, we don't like it. He might have thrown another pick. He might have thrown. Of course, him. we don't fucking know. I mean, that's, that's what all I'm saying. saying. Like, I, but it I was got, his first outing, man. Yeah, that's what. That, but see, like, that's an argument that you wouldn't be able to make if he would have played more, right? We don't know. Like, you don't know that it would have just ultimately went better. But I can't say that it would have went worse. So, like, all we could go by is what the fuck we saw, which was utterly like pretty much nothing. I mean, I just think you can't judge a lot, honestly, because that line was so shit. Even all right, if that line was strong and he was still throwing that up, uh, throwing that way, and wasn't you know wasn't able to do much, that's one thing. But that line was just garbage from from the minute that he stepped on the field. He didn't have a chance. That was not set up for. This was not set up for failure. And listen, you brought this topic, but we didn't really discuss it. You talked about the failure of Nick Casario not able to construct. Um, a good roster, right? He, he's, all right, so here's the harsh truth. I call him Pope Casera because anytime I mention it, everyone fucking hates my guts, all right? But I'm going to mention it again anyway. So if we look at the track record, if we go from 2021, the only starter that we have in that entire draft is Nico Collins right now. And so far, and I'm hoping that he Nico Collins pans out, man, I have his rookie jersey there signed for a reason because when he played for Michigan, I thought that he would be successful. But the last two seasons, he was a king in in preseason games and in camp and then didn't do much in the regular season, right? So of that 2020 draft, all we have is Nico Collins as a starter and we gave up two-fourths and a fifth to go get him, right? So he was a third-round pick, 80-something whatever it was, on top of the third round pick, we gave up two fourths and a fifth. So it's a third, two fourths and a fifth. It's a lot for a receiver, right? And we're still thinking that we need an actual true wide receiver one, right? That's why a lot of people are talking about trying to get T Higgins. So we still need a wide receiver one after we spent that. Only person in 2021. In 2022, we have, uh, we, we have our corner, um, Sting, and we have Kenyon Green. Now, I'm a big believer that Sting is going to actually produce this year. However, if we go by what he has produced this year, I'm sorry, last year, he was out for most of the season. He didn't have the best year. Now, did he? everyone goes the, by the stat that he hasn't let up a touchdown. But when you're only playing nine games, you can't. that stat doesn't have a lot of weight because you're simply not there enough to have that stat mean something. So... So he made a couple good plays, like he had that play against Alex Pierce. He made a, a few, but he also got burned. Now he also wasn't in the right system. Um, you know, I know that we disagree on this, but you know, he's a he's a man guy who's playing mostly zone, and so we know that that he he should be better in this system, and hopefully he stays healthy. Kenyon Green, another pick in the first round. He had a horrible season. So you have both first round picks did not produce last year. We're hoping they produce this year. I've got a lot more faith in Sting than I do in Kenny Green, but I have hope that they both can produce this year. So we're talking we're talking about the two drafts that so far there isn't a ton to show for in terms of high draft picks. Now, he also got Jalen Petrie. Jalen Petrie. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> I always get the hands wrong. I can't ever get it right. But uh, Jayla Petrie is my favorite pick that Nick Casario made. Damian Pierce, fourth round, great running back pick. So we, he did get some stars. It's not like I'm saying that he didn't get anyone, but I mean, for, people love Harris. You love people. Love oh, yeah, Harris. you're right. Christian Harris is a, another great pick. I mean, but, that's a starter. So that's three. I don't want to call Ken Green like a plus starter, but like, no, you can't. Um, staying. Uh, Sting, Pierce, Christian Harris, Harris, and Petrie, and Petrie. Wait, Sting, Pierce. Her- that's four starters in one draft. That's a very good draft. Um, the 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 year before that, I mean, like I always say, it's half. It was half of a draft, and he. It was. A well, just remember though, when we're talking about Sting, that's hope, right? Because he hasn't shown that yet. So. I think like, and you said this, like, listen, like. You know, I think when we have these conversations, it's very important that we get them right. Like, if we're going to quote, we got to get people right. Like, 
the the thing I think when people say that Sting is a is a is a man corner and all this shit and that, and that shit, it's like bro, like listen, I mean, if you listen to what Lovey Smith describes as as what he wants his corner to be, it would fucking be Derek Stingley. You know what I'm saying? So like my thing is like I think he was he proved that he can play cover too. But the thing is, is that like everything looks bad when the front seven gets his ass whooped as much as our front seven got his ass whooped. Like, and I always bring up the shit. I bring up Robert Sala. Like, Robert Sala runs a similar scene to D'Amico. His first year in uh, in um, New York, they look like shit. They only won two more games. They won, They went from, like, two games to four games, right? Um, Quentin Williams did not play, have the best year. And then what happened was they went out and got a corner. They went out and, you know, they got healthy. They drafted two edges. And then next thing you know, Quentin Williams is exactly the player that we thought he would have been, you know, initially because of the supporting cast. Right. I did similar thing with Derek Stingley. And I think that we're going to see him play cover two this year, two guys. Of course. Know, of course he's going to play cover two. And I think what you'll see is he'll be better in cover two because, like, we should be able to get more. Because we have coverage now? Well, yeah, because everything around him is better. Not only the we same got a pass team. rush and we got coverage. I mean, yeah. which we did so not like, really have last think, year. So, like, it's he's a corner that can play every. You don't draft people that high. I mean, unless they're quarterbacks and shit like that, the specialty. I don't think you draft guys like that that are that high to where they're like they're really scheme dependent. Like you have like there's things that make those guys special. Like there's things that Sauce and Stanley can do that generally no other fucking player at their position at their age can do, right? You know what I mean? Um, that's why they were drafted high. If Stingley was a pure, like, zone corner, he wouldn't have been drafted at number three or whatever the fuck. You know what I'm saying? Well, well, I, and I'm not, not to – I just want to make sure you didn't misunderstand. I'm not saying that he can only play man, but he – But but that's, that's how, but that's how people make it out to be. Like, they act like when – he, they act like when there's a pass completed on his side of the field and we're in cover two, that he didn't play it right. Like, that's not true. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's not like, like, and I mean, even like Lovey Smith, I think that like, like, okay, like, was it Vanilla? Did he call that those, did he call that a lot? Like, of course he did. But at the same time, like, I guarantee you that if you was to ask him, why do you call that shit so much? And there was like no cameras around and nothing was recorded. I'm sure that he would say some shit like, I just don't trust a lot of these motherfuckers. <laughs> you know, I'm, and I know that they could do that one thing. And he probably wouldn't have said Derek Stingley. Like, I'm getting, and, you know, and that's all I'm saying, like in general. Like, you know, I think that's why a lot of our everything was vanilla last year. You know what I'm saying? But like at the end of the day, like, you know, I think that Derek Stingley, like he he was, and he got then he got hurt. I think that, and the thing about Nico that I want to say, bro, and I've thought about this a lot, and um, the thing is, is like I'm a raw saint, but people compare him to like I'm a raw because of like I guess I'm a raw's drafted after him, and he's been a very productive player in the league. The thing about it is Nico, like the upside on Nico, is like. Kind of is higher than Amara because he's a bigger, really more athletic player. The upside of him, I'm you know, really, well, Amara is like a pure slot. I liked him a lot coming out, you know, but I, I think like like um, he's a pure slot. The thing about Nico is like he has the physicals to end up being a, a number one. And I think the thing is is that the argument for like against him is like you have to give it context also. Like, he has been hurt, right? So, I think the first year he played, like, six or seven games, he had 400 yards. If he ended up playing the whole season and he has a seven, 800, 850-yard season, you know, and then the next year if he does the same thing, are we really sweating that pick? Like, are we sweating that pick going into year three? I mean, listen, Amon Ra had, what, 1,100 yards last year, right? Um, and so, you know, the first year he had some health problems too, but the second year he showed out with about 1100 yards, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, listen, Nico, this is, in my opinion, for me, this is the year Nico one has to stay healthy and number two has to have at least 
Give me 700 yards. You give me 700 yards and you stay healthy, all right. Nico, you solidified your wide receiver two position, but I still think you go out there and you get a true wide receiver well, one. Well, you always, you always uh, try to upgrade, mm-hmm. right? But like, so, so Amara had 90 catches, 900 yards the first year, 100 catches, a hundred, uh, um, you know, um, like 111, like 1150 yards the next year. But again, like I'm saying, like part of that also, like think about it. Oh my bad. Part of that also is like. Um, you have to think about it too, like bro. He stayed healthy. If you're getting ninety catches, a hundred catches, you stay healthy. Of course. Second of all, he, you know, he's on the offense that. Although I understand people want to say that it's like, it's uh, like you. Nobody really thinks about uh, like their offense is being like a good offense, um, like roster wise, you know. But the fact is, is that like. It was a hell of a lot better than us. You know what I'm saying? Like, like he had uh, I mean, you know, it was a hell of a lot better than us. It was they had a better O line. They, they had, had a top ten O line last year. We had a bottom five. They had a they had a better they had yeah, they had really like a top five, a top three offensive line, pretty much since he's fucking been there. And they had better quarterback play. Right. And right. then they had they had one of the, an elite tight end Hawkinson pretty much. They had, you know, I mean, they had DJ like they said, they had a decent deep threat. You know, what I mean, and it was a it was enough to like to to no, I think he's been very, very good. He's definitely exceeded his like expectations. I think he was like a fourth or fifth round draft pick. Like so he's been uh very productive. I really like him coming out, but he's a slot and slots fucking you never know how far you could fall or how high you end up getting drafted. But like the thing is, is like I think and I do think that he probably would have ended up being more fucking productive than Nico if Nico had stayed healthy. But he also was just in like a completely different, better situation. I agree. I mean listen, I, I think that Nico's biggest problem is his health, right? And if he gets hurt again for this again this year, I think that's it. I think I think you I think he's he's depth and that's it, right? Obviously, you're not going to get rid of him during his rookie contract or anything like that. But if he can't stay healthy this year and give us at least 15 games, he's regulated to where I said before wide receiver four, you know. Um, so I mean, I'm not shitting on Nico. Like I really want him to do well. I just need him to stay healthy. And I don't know if if that'll happen, but we'll see. But what I'm saying is that, like, I think that, like, when you call that that pick a miss, and what I kind of just started even thinking about today when I'm watching Nico just burn the shit out of, like, the Dolphins and practice and shit, and when I see him have these insane flashes in in game, I can't really say that that's a miss for Casario because Nico Collins has proved that when he's on the field, he's a legit NFL player, right? Like. It's not like it's not like he can't fucking play. It's about his health, man. Yeah. It's not about his playability. Like, 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 like he he nailed the character of the guy. He nailed the, the football character. Nico's always working out. He's he's he stays after practice the last year and I feel like I don't I haven't heard that much this year. He did it, he did he's doing it this year, he did it last year. He, he has great he, he has great rookie year too. He has great professionalism and I mean he's he's pretty much changed his body every fucking year that he's been in the league every offseason he's come back in better shape like you can't necessarily control a guy straining the hamstring so like even in that sense like I can't really hold that pick against Casario in reality because that's just life right like like life kind of got in the way and I understand like you know in the grand scheme people will blame Casario and then every pick after that in that draft is like bro like Every pick after that in that draft is like kind of like it's a depth like okay like so we got a we got a, a backup quarterback in the third round that's normal you know a receiver that wide well, receiver four range in the third round that's normal uh I mean I think Gary Wallow was after that I, I hate this whole standard that you that we have to that you're putting us to that you can't ever find starters in the late round because the whole point of having what Cal said that Nick was, quote, an expert talent evaluator, is that you find talent in these later rounds 
right? But bro, like, like, but when I Tufunga was the fifth round pick, he became an all pro. You said who? Tufunga. Tufunga. Again, Tufunga like, was a third round pick. He became an all pro. What was Tufunga put into? Like, Tufunga was put into a defense that was the best. Fuck, he had the best front seven. A top two, top three front seven in the fucking NFL. When Warner was a third round him, pick. Like, Warner was a third round pick too. So it's not just. Well, ice yeah, I mean, I mean, if you take Bosa and you take Armstead and you take a Buckner when he was there, and you, and you take D four and all these guys out and you put them in there, like it's like some Christian Harris. Like, bro, if Christian Harris ends up being the best fucking weak side linebacker in NFL this year or next year, what the fuck can we say? Because like at that point. We would have had three or four drafts to, to 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 build around him and to have him play his role. Like Fred Warner isn't just the best player on an ass team. Like like Roquan Smith was an all pro level fucking player on an ass team. He's the generational linebacker. And Fred Warner is too. And he could have he probably could do the same shit. But at the end of the day, he didn't. And the same thing with Hugh Funger. Hugh Funger was it has like crazy fucking instincts and all that shit. But it's just like you said about Petrie. Like, I mean, I mean, is Hugh Funga actually better than Petrie? I don't fucking no. know. No, he's not, man. Right? And that's what I'm saying. Like, 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 like when you think about these, like a lot of people, like, you know, it, a lot of players, like they get instances. And that's what I said, bro. Every year that we end up uh, going forward, our rookies will be put in a better position. I mean, listen, you're not you're not wrong, but when you are talking about Casera um, uh, this far, of course, in the future is different, it's right? Like, been, it's only been he's only we've only seen two drafts. Well, this would be this 2023 right. was the third, and but, they we haven't, haven't seen the and they, but like, the reason I said two right now is because we haven't seen the result. But okay, so let me get to my end point, and then if you want, we can start wrapping it up. Unless you have some. You know, I'll rebuff this, but but my end point is that so far, if we take a look at the head coach, right? So at first he wanted Josh McCowan. What happened was that at that point there was a lot of pushback media wise about hiring a white head coach when we had just fired a black head coach. So the media side of it was rough. Um Ownership talked to Nick Casario. Nick Casario wanted Josh McCowan, and then they pivoted, and then they got Lovey Smith. But we have to say that Nick Casario's primary choice at that point was not was Josh McCowan. All right. Then we're talking about this year. Now we have reports that uh, D'Amico Ryan's was not his first pick. It was Jonathan Gannon. All right. So uh, Jonathan Gannon, who for the most part, like if you talk to anyone from the Eagles side, they say that while they, whilst, you know, they didn't necessarily like his defense, but I mean, I don't know how you can't, I would say on that part, they're kind of crazy because the Eagles have a top defense. They also have obviously roster construction wise, they have a, a you know great roster. But one of the things that I can uh, agree with is that, is he a leader of men? Um, you know, he just seems weird. He doesn't seem able to connect with his players. We've seen bits and pieces. We've seen the press conferences. I mean, in all reality, he acts like, I mean, seriously, he acts like a little bitch when he's in a press conference. He actually complained about how hard um, the, the press was uh, when he was a Philadelphia Eagle. When he was at the Eagles, he complained, literally spent like two minutes on it, about how hard it was to deal with the press. I mean, you're fucking kidding me? You're in the NFL, at a league that's a near $20 billion league. Of course, you're going to have hard press on, on a team, um, you know, that went to the Super Bowl and, and that was doing well. What do you think? So I, I just think that he doesn't connect well. And honestly, he's just a, just a bit of a pussy. So I just don't, I don't like him. I didn't like him as a, a top head coach candidate. I, I, I could have settled with it, but he was not my first choice or my second or my third. You know who my first was. It was Shane Steichen was my first. Um, D'Amico, um, I had him tie really second and third, but Shane Steichen was my number one pick. Very happy with the D'Amico pick. But again, talking about Casario, Jonathan Gannon was his. And if you believe the reports, which I do, ownership overrode him and said, we want D'Amico Ryan. So ownership had to override his head coach. Then if you believe other reports, he didn't want to draft CJ Stroud. He didn't want to draft anyone besides Bryce Young for quarterback. Ownership convinced him 
that we needed a top quarterback. Now, of course, Nick Casario wanted Bryce Young. A lot of people did. I'm not going to fault him for that. I was not a Bryce Young guy. You were not a Bryce Young guy. But nonetheless, many people were. Um, so I'm not going to fault him for that. But he did not want to draft C.J. Stroud. Instead, he drafted C.J. Stroud at number two and then traded the world off of Will Anderson. I am. I don't want to necessarily go back it, um, and, and say how much that at the time disturbed me. I'm okay with that because I think that Will Anderson is going to be the black J.J. Watt. So at the end of the day, it's okay, but I do think that he overpaid for it. And so, so the whole point of this is what I'm trying to say is when you look at what we gave up for Will Anderson, what we gave up for John Mechie, Drew Scruggs, I'm hoping he's a guy, but he's a guy that none of us talked about when it came to the center position about who would actually be here at, at center. We wanted JMS, we wanted Ricky. We had a lot of dudes, we named five of them that none of us talked about Drew Scruggs. So we're hoping that he made the right call on Drew Scruggs. Obviously, Juice Gross is a rookie, so we'll see how he performs this year. Point is, is that he's made a lot of questionable decisions, a lot of questionable choices. He, ownership overrode him to get the quarterback and the head coach. Two huge positions, right? Nick Casario did not choose the quarterback necessarily. Nick Casario did not choose the head coach. Ownership got involved. I also think that he made some very questionable decisions when it comes to the draft, both in 2021 and 2022. We'll see if those things pan out, but right away, they definitely did not. Point is, is that I think that to say that Nick Casario has done, a, like some people who believe Nick Casario has done a phenomenal job, I would say he's done an okay job. I, I think he did okay. Um, I think that this draft looks very, very good so far, probably his best draft. Um, obviously, we haven't seen any players play yet, but I think this is probably his best draft. Knowing that, you know that ownership got involved in the first round picks again, right? Right? He would not have made those choices. So that's when I say that I am not. I am not of the mindset that Nick Casario is infallible. He's made plenty of mistakes. Everyone talks about the fact that he got the finances straight. Well, of that seventy-five million dollar dead cap hit, forty-eight million was essentially not his problem but 25 million was he added to it meaning that he added players like anthony miller where he let go after just a few weeks and he and of course you want to continue to add talent i get that but everyone says he fixed a 75 million dollar dead cap issue well again 48 million was not his issue but the rest was he added to that dead cap issue and of course he just didn't he got rid of players that had high contracts any intern could have done that. that. That's not magic. That's just playing it out and waiting until the dead cap falls. Next year, we're going to see how he performs because we're going to have $100 million in cap space. But, and I'm not saying this as a Casario hater. What I am saying is that logically, you cannot say that Casario has, um, has just done a great, great job. He's done, in my opinion, a mediocre job. Um, and we'll see if he really stands out this next offseason when he has actual money. He gave up that first round pick. So unless the Browns do pretty bad, we may not have a top 10 pick. I'm predicting eight wins. So we should have somewhere around, uh, you know, pick 10, pick 12, or something around there. But um, but he gave up our first round pick. So unless the Browns do something, we're not going to have a top 10 pick. And so we'll see what he does this offseason. But so far, my assessment of Nick Casario is, eh, that's, that's what I got to say. Yeah, that's what I got to say, bro. Like, to begin with, like, I feel like, I mean, well, Nick Sirianni gave one of the worst presses ever. And he's been, I think, of his coaching class, He's been the most successful guy in his coaching class, like easily, because he went to the Super Bowl within in within two years. Um, so to me, like judging Gannon off of press conferences and shit like that, it, and it's it's kind of like kind of like kind of erroneous to me because like it doesn't fucking matter at the end of the day. I think he's going to a situation that's different than D'Amico's, that he's going to a situation similar to, like, where we were, like, down there with Watson. You know what I mean? Uh, basically, essentially the same fucking thing with possibly a worse quarterback, right? You know, and honestly, even a worse situation, not only because Kyle Murray isn't as good as Watson yet, um, he's, uh, he's injured, you know? Yeah. So... 
And then he, he, you know, he has no pieces on defense. Like, it's just a very fucked up situation. So the odds of him being successful there are low. And I think really that we're like, because of that, people will always have that, um, they will always compare the two and say, ha, 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 Nick was wrong. But at the end of the day, like, there might have been, like I always say, there could have been very specific reasons why you would choose Gannon over D'Amico to him that we will never know because he came here thinking that he would have some type of control that was ended up being stripped from him. Um, secondly, from that, it's like we don't know what kind of coach D'Amico is going to be in reality in the end. Um, uh, and, and this draft, like, maybe there was legit reason that he didn't like Stroud, right? Like, maybe there was legit – like, to me, when we made that trade, it just showed me that he wasn't completely confident and comfortable taking um, Stroud as being the only top five pick that we had. Because to me, like, I just – I don't think – I don't know. Like, I, I believe the rumors that we saw, because they ended up being true any fucking way, that, that, that we liked Bryce – that we weren't sold on the quarterback – if we had to take a quarterback, it would have been Bryce Young, and we love Will Anderson because at the end of the day, we drafted C.J. Stroud and we traded up for Anderson. So, like to me, it's kind of like, bro, like I think the way that the way that he was going about building the team, it could have worked out, but in the end, it like I think he thought that he was going to have a certain amount of time to do it, and it didn't happen. I think that we and and I mean we still haven't played these games because at the end of the day if Stroud goes out there and looks ass for like the whole year and we win sub five games then Nick was fucking right no he wasn't because again it's the first year I mean I'm not judging no, Stroud yeah, until no, his third year no because if we if we suck ass this year and we and we have a top three pick this is the fucking truth if we had suck ass this year and we had a top three fucking pick and we had a chance to take either Caleb or Drake May or whatever quarterback. But then that's Nick's stupid decision to trade up the pick anyway, because he gave away our pick. So we, but but so so you would be comfortable taking CJ Stroud and Drake May next year? How I mean, stupid would that look? I would have said Caleb Williams, but not Drake yeah, May. I no. mean, to me, they're like the same, fuck, they're the same caliber. No, 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 they're definitely not. They're yes, definitely they not. They, they're listen, really- listen, all right, this, we're, we're kind of going off the wheels here, but I have to say this. Kayla Williams, in my okay, opinion. Let's just assume Kayla Williams. Even there's two, there's two quarterbacks that people are talking about being generational. It's Kayla Williams and Drake May. And then you got fucking Joe Milton, who's fucking damn near AR. He has a stronger arm than AR. And you have a, there's a bunch of quarterbacks next year. Fucking Spencer Rowley is fucking killing it, apparently. So what I'm trying to say is that the moment that ownership came in and said, that you have to take a quarterback and pick two, no matter who the fuck it is. And we know that it can't be two guys. Like it was over. So like, there's no, like if, if we end up pick, if, if we end up trading a pick that was in range of taking that, uh, of taking a quarterback next year, then the whole thing was fucking. Retarded. But who gave up the pick? It wasn't ownership to give up the pick to get Will but, Anderson. But, gee, listen to what I'm saying. They weren't going to let him take Will. They weren't going to let him take Will Anderson at two. I understand that. I get that. But my point is that he could have gotten, he could have either negotiated better and gave up the Browns pick. And I know that they had him by the balls because he, because by the way, I mean, like I haven't said this, uh, shout out to uh, Chris Royal from the H-Town Rundown who, who has coined this phrase that uh, basically Casario does not know how to negotiate. And I completely 100% fucking agree oh. that maybe hold on, hold on, hold on. That, if you look at his past, when, when we're talking about trading up for Nico Collins, trading up for John Mechie, trading up to get Juice Scruggs, um, the he does not get great deals when when he's talking about trades. In fact, if you go by you know the Jimmy Johnson trade value chart, he's only won really one fucking trade, and that trade was the when, when he traded down to get Canyon Green. Other than that, he's pretty much lost every other trade when it came to draft. To, to draft night. So he does not have a record at trading well, and he gave up his hand talking to Arizona that day when he showed his fucking balls and said, I want Will Anderson. He basically, it was Vontae or bust. That was basically draft day, right? It was Vontae or bust, and that's what he did. He didn't give a fuck what he was giving up. He gave up the will for Will Anderson. And 
I'm not saying he was wrong to do it because it may have been the right thing to do. But but in this argument, when you're saying he had no choice, he motherfucking did have a choice. And he decided oh. that his choice yeah. was Will Anderson versus it's Anderson. Right here. Like, well, well, I mean, if you look at what we traded to get up to three, it basically was down to the same shit that San Francisco traded to get up to three. It was three fucking first round picks. And they gave up three first round picks plus like two mid round picks. We gave up arguably basically a first round pick in thirty two, and uh and uh like this is this is the reality. The only reason that you can even say that we overpaid for this trade is if this pick ends up being a top three pick. Correct. Correct. So, so, so what I'm saying is that if you have the same belief that you do in this team, saying that we're gonna win seven eight games, then that pick eight is not really worth as much, right? So what I'm saying, I mean, that's my point because this is the this is the conversation, right? The conversation is that he chose. He, he, he we're basically saying we that we chose C.J. Stroud, and that but we could have gotten a quarterback next year. And what I'm saying is that is that Nick Casario took that option away, so that even oh, if he didn't take that option away, because like, listen, if you take a quarterback at two, right? Like, do you know how crazy that shit would have looked if he would have turned right back around and taken a quarterback in the top three again? I mean, Arizona did it, right? I mean, Arizona took Josh Rosen and then took, uh, uh, you and know. They fired, they, didn't they fire fucking the, the coach? Got, it took something drastic to happen for that shit to, to go on, right? What I'm saying is that, like, like, do you think Cal and Hannah, big ball? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> do you think Cal and Hannah, would have swallowed their pride and been like, you know what? We were dead ass wrong about what we did last year. Go ahead and take your quarterback now. There's no guarantee that we would have been like. I, I think I think they would have. You know why? No, no, no. I'll yeah. tell you why. I'll tell you why. No. Because they have they had immediate concerns, which is they needed a quarterback because we didn't have one. Mills was not it. Like, and that's why I keep saying, bro. They, they, but then we need a quarterback, but we need one of two quarterbacks, right? And you don't like one of them, and you have to trade up to get the other one, right? So Bryce Young is gone. You need a quarterback, a black quarterback. I, I, I uh, they didn't. Just, that wasn't the way. I that know, was. Just because he's black, but you know, let's face it. I mean, bro, that's why I say like I don't know. Like, like I know people say I think Levis and all those guys was out of the out of the contention for the number two overall pick. But let's say that if Levis fell to thirty two, right? on draft day and we had a 32nd pick who's to say that they don't take levis right there who's the well, that- well listen I, I told you what i was told general managers and scouts took him off their board because of his attitude well, and it was he failed at the he, interview so he was he off failed. the board he failed well i mean for two I, I'm saying no, no, no. he was off the to, board. You have to take a completely, like literally, like there was no way but they you were going to take players. a quarterback. To me, the what to me, and this is what I'll say, and I hope it's not true, but like I think at the end of the day, like we're a dysfunctional franchise. We've been a dysfunctional franchise for five years, and I think that when that when situations happen, like what happened, if ownership forced to pick over the fucking football guy, the guy that you fucking severed the relationship with, your your franchise quarterback, your first franchise quarterback, right? You severed the relationship to go get him, and then you overriding him to go get a quarterback that he isn't completely sold on? Like, then at that point, if you're having these type of doubts, then fire him too. Like, let D'Amico pick his own, his complete own people. I mean, listen, there's definitely an argument for that, but I think what they believe is that Nick Casario, although they didn't believe in everything that, that he decided, thought that he could still have a great draft. Now, I actually think that overall, Nick Casario had a great draft for 2023. We're going to see how that performs this year, but I do think they were right when they overrode him on the head coach, head coach more than anything, honestly. I, I think they were right um, because long-term, that D'Amico is going to be here even if Nick Casario goes, D'Amico's going to be here even when Casario's gone. So long-term, having D'Amico well, is the right thing well, to do. Because that first well, hold on. Okay. And, and then number two, we needed a, quarter, a quarterback, and we couldn't get Bryce Young. And so you had to pick one. That sounds great until it doesn't work out. Yeah, but the whole thing is that... You, but, uh, when, but, but hold on, I, I'll let you finish. That okay, sounds go great. Ahead, go the ahead. whole thing 
the whole thing. You needed a quarterback, so you took a quarterback. It sounds great until you fucking out the Jets and you took two fucking quarterbacks within four years in the top three. Sorry. Two quarterbacks in the in the in the in the top three in fucking four years. Within the same four years, right? And then on top of that, like the whole of course D'Amico's gonna stay here. And I, I think D'Amico's gonna be a fine coach. But of course D'Amico's gonna stay here over Casario because he's not even like because the owners chose him over Casario. Even and, and I'm happy about it. Even if D'Amico go well, I mean, but if okay, I, I'll go there in a second. But even if D'Amico looks completely inept this year, which he he won't. Like I don't think he's gonna be ass. But what I'm saying is that like, even if he did look straight ass, bro, guess who would have to live with that damn decision? The McNairs, right? And right. It's their team, and so they're gonna have to live with that. So what I'm saying is that like 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 to say that like. From all Nick can go off of what Nick, how Nick views shit, how he sees shit. Maybe there was some, maybe like him and Gannon could have worked very, very, very well. But we don't know. We don't I mean, know. I, I do, it's, I it's do unfair, think it's unfair to assume that it would go wrong and that D'Amico would go right. Like, because there's nothing, like, bro, we haven't seen D'Amico, like, we haven't seen D'Amico ever coach a team that lacked talent, ever. And he's only been coaching for five fucking years. But this team doesn't lack talent now. It does. We have holes, but we're not completely we uh, talent deficient. D'Amico, we haven't seen D'Amico coach a team that wasn't an elite, talented team. Like, you just talked about Fred Warner. You talked about Dre, Dre Greenlaw. You talk about Jimmy Ward. You talk about Nick Bosa, who's the defensive player of the year. You talk about uh, our Eric Armstead, you know, Ken Law. Um, who else? Um, the guy that we just picked up also, um, uh, uh, Hassan Ridgeway. You know, but, but we're, we're talking. We're talking about Will Anderson, who's projected to be the defensive player of the year. We're talking about Petrie, who I think will be year, an All Pro. We're one. talking about Stingley, who could it's be a Pro Bowl. It's year one, where he's the best. It's year one, bro. Like, I don't. I think that Will Anderson can be as good as uh, Nick Bosa, but Nick Bosa came in and got 15 sacks on a on a team where. He probably never damn near saw any double teams because, I mean, next to him was Buckner. Next to him was Armstead. On the other side of him was, like, like I said, was D Ford and uh, D Ford. And then they had, uh, uh, I'm going blank on the other edge rusher. I think it might have been, I don't think it was Ebucom then, but they had a little rotation, right? Uh, and then behind him was, uh, was uh, um, shit, I think at that point it was Quan Alexander and, um, and, um, and obviously Fred Warner, right? And Aziz and Aziz. These are all guys that we all wanted. And then uh, you know, obviously Jimmy Ward and all those guys, right? And Richard, I think he I don't know if he coached Richard Sherman for that one year, but but like the defense was stacked. Like Will Anderson is coming in to is coming into like where the game plan is fucking Will Anderson. Like the game plan is block Will Anderson. Do I think do I know that? And I was a guy that said we should have taken took Will Anderson at two. Do I fucking think that Will Anderson is gonna just come in and be uh you know beating chips and all that shit? Well, even he's done it in practice. He has created pressure while being chipped and all that shit. But what I'm saying is that it's a completely different situation. Like Bosa was came into a spot where he was like him getting 15 sacks was incredible, but he also had all the fucking help in the world. Like everybody around him was doing their job and, and they fit perfectly around him. Like we like our best two defensive tackles are literally like undersized defensive tackles next to an edge rusher that was a that people said was undersized when we drafted him undersized as a defensive end. Right. Listen, we know that we have holes. I'm not saying that. What I I'm am not saying, saying that we no, I'm not saying that we have holes. What I'm saying is that like we're not as talented as the Niners are. Oh, of course. Come on. I'm not saying we and are. That's what I'm so like, like, even with Anderson, like, like for us to see him at his best, like, it's, it's basically... It's going to take a couple years before yeah. we see him at his best. Yeah. Uh, there's no disagreement there. What I'm saying is, when you said that D'Amico is, has never is never come to a team without talent, I'm saying that we're not, we're not talent efficient. Okay. okay, let me rephrase what I'm saying. Not that we don't have talent, we don't have elite talent. Like he doesn't like we like. Perriman is a good linebacker. He's not Fred Warner. Um, 
I think Christian Harris probably can he could be elite. Can be better than Drake Greenlaw or Quan Alexander. I think Will Anderson in a lot of ways can end up being better than Bosa in a lot of ways. I don't know that he will ever be the same type of pass rusher, like the exact how technical Bosa right. is all that shit. Right. But like in terms of everything else, there's nothing around like there is not shit really around Anderson. There's no like you don't have an a you don't have a dominant defensive tackle next to him. You don't have a dominant edge on the other side of him. And, and but I mean the strength is we have a secondary. But at the end of the day, like you know, our two best defensive tackles might not be able to be played with at the same time um in some games. So that's what I'm saying. Like like if he comes in and year one has like like if he has a top eight defense year one with with this, then he's probably the premier defense of mine and and the the in national football in the in the NFL. Right. But until he does that, we don't know because I haven't seen him I haven't seen him game like, you know, all the crazy shit that people say they love, like when fucking Fred Warner comes down and he's mugging the line of scrimmage and then once the ball is snapped, he's fucking running thirty yards down the field to fucking cover. Uh, uh, CD Lamb. I don't know that we have a guy that can do that. Oh, all right. Listen, we we all know that we are, don't have as much talent as the 49ers. All I'm trying to say is that D'Amico is going to come into a room that isn't as talent deficient as we've had in the past two years. So he's going to come in here, and I do think that what we've seen so far in camp, what we've seen in preseason, is that our defense is going to be strong. But that's not saying. Bottom line is, let, let me just close it up, because we're talking about, you know, we're talking about a head coach change because we're getting in the woods right now right the, the whole thing was about whether casario had uh choices were right versus well, we, don't know. we don't know yet we don't know yet we're gonna we're, we're gonna have we, we will know we will know in a couple of years we'll know right Wait, uh, how will we know because you don't know what gannon is gonna could we, 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 i said a couple of years so you can't judge gannon this year all right give him another year in two years from now we will be able to judge and see who made the right call and, and I think that D'Amico is the right call. I will say this. If you had Gannon here, there is absolutely no way that you, had, you would have players buying in to Jonathan Gannon the way they're buying in to D'Amico Ryans. It's just not going to happen, right? Um, D'Amico Ryans played, played here. And so, and, and it's only, it's not even that long ago. We're talking 2011. So it's not like he was some dude that played, you know, 30 fucking years ago. So because of all, all of those factors, not coming, not only is he coming back to Houston, but he actually played in the NFL fairly early on. He is, his personality is very player centric. He plays, he plays hard. He's a, he, he looks like a great coach in, in, in San Francisco. Now we'll see if he's a good head coach. I don't think that in, in all the other intangibles that he would have, that, that Jonathan Gannon would ever been able to round the troops up the way Domico Ryans is right now. That I think you can all can say now before we even see a, a snap this season. What we'll find out is whether or not Domico Ryans can actually lead us to wins. When we we gotta have this discussion at the end of the season and see what you think about Domico. We probably won't be able to have the discussion on Jonathan Gannon for another year, maybe two, but we'll be able to figure out um, whether D'Amico was a guy. And I personally very happy that ownership over. I, I am too. I mean, I'm I it's not like it's not like I I don't think that it was I don't think you know, because he's he's proven, you know, that he, you know, I mean he's a good coach, right? I'm not saying he's not a coach, but I'm talking about when it comes to the fit between him and Casario, when it comes to what Casario viewed in between him and Gannon. And then also another thing that we're not even factoring in that we haven't talked about, and we'll shut it down, and maybe this was something we can talk about on a slower day, is like just how the relationship between him and D'Amico and Casario can form and fit to be better than what they even thought it could have been in the beginning. So there's a lot of different ways that this can go. But at the end of the day, in terms of speculation on what he saw and what, what they saw, like, in the end, like we'll never really know the exact what could have been. You know, we of can predict and all that shit. Because one guy could fail one play, like Frank Wright. To some people, he failed in Indianapolis, and then he could go off and fucking, you know, make the NFC title game in two years, and the Panthers. And would they have been wrong for firing them? No. You know, 
they might have, they definitely handled situations in a fucked up manner. And he probably was part of that too. But like, you know, it's not like, you know, I mean, shit changes. Like Lovey Smith was a championship head coach, championship level uh, DC, you know what I'm saying? Before, you know, and he comes to us and, you know, because of the situation and, you know, time and all that shit, like he looked bad. Right. And I can't argue that he looked bad, you know, because it did look bad. But one thing I can say is that if circumstances were different, I'm 100% sure we wouldn't have been 32nd ranked defense in, in both major fucking categories one year. Cause, and then we improved the second year, and we'll end on this. And that I'm saying that because, like, you know, actually, man, fuck it, you know, we're done. That's all. <laughs> so, yeah, all right, y'all, you know, make sure y'all like, Share and sub, follow us, man. And, um, you know, this was a really long episode. So, man, peace, y'all. Check out later, bro.